Check, check. Uh, hi, guys. Let me uh, apologize for our late start. And uh, to kick this off properly, I think I need to say, developers, developers. Oh, wait. I'm in the wrong meeting. Sorry. All right. Who the heck am I? My name is Tom Brooks, and I work here at the Adler Planetarium. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our universe theater, courtesy of Ray Kroc from McDonald's. Um, who the heck am I? I wear a lot of hats here at the planetarium. Uh, you guys might not know that we are pretty much 90 plus percent Mac based uh, for exhibits, classrooms, staff, you name it. So we are a Mac house and we have been one for a long time. Um, why are we doing this at the Adler? You may have read on a certain blog that we're all fond of that uh, there was going to be a talk at the Apple store on Michigan Avenue. It kind of fell through. Who knows why? Maybe because some sensitive topics were going to be discussed. DRM, I don't know. And, um, and I thought, well, hey, you know, we already host uh, or did host a uh, Mac SIG called Trow, the rest of us, who now meet over at the Apple Store. And um, we also host uh, Chifsey Pug, which is the Chicago Final Cut Pro user group. And they meet down here, I think, on the last Wednesday of every month. So I said, you know, it'd be a cool thing to have this. And uh, Let's, let's do it. So I pulled some strings, and, and here we are. Um, I think I've already told you guys the bathrooms are that way. You may be wondering about the angels bowling, and you hear the rumbling noises. Don't worry. That's just the CTA buses going right over your heads. <laughs> We've had the theater's ceiling reinforced a couple of times. We keep getting these sinkholes. It'll happen one day. <laughs> so... Um, Throughout the evening, we've decided that if you guys have any questions, tough. No, no, no. If you have questions, please just raise your hand. And there's a fellow, Chris, I believe, back there who's waving at you. And uh, just kind of put up your hand, let him know, look back at him, dude, hello. And uh, he'll come down and maybe pass the mic over. So just don't bogart it, please, like I am. He'll find you. And with that, who is Drunken Batman? I think he's more myth than man. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't sure if he was going to wear the mask and the cape. Uh, dude, uh, so. Yeah, oh, he is, trust me. <laughs> There's not water in his bottle. All right. Um, well, I first, uh, I think I first found out about him through the whole uh, Maui Extreme, ooh, <laughs> Cherry OS debacle, and uh, I've been reading on and off ever since. So, hey. BB, here, let me hand the mic off. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're actually, this is going to be a pretty informal affair. We're going to uh, start off real quick and introduce who's actually here. Um, actually, we're going to have them introduce themselves. Uh, we're basically just going to have a conversation. We're not going to. Um, have presentations, nothing like that, just a conversation. Uh, for that, we can have Roshina introduce himself and we'll go down the line. Yeah, Roshina, I work for Unsanity, found co founder. I do a lot of stuff Menu Master, Font Card, Silk, Labels X, Menu Extra Enabler, CPU, yada, yada, yada. My name is Gus Mueller. Uh, I'm the sole owner of Flying Meat. Um, I wrote a couple of apps called VoodooPad and FlySketch and FlyGesture. So. Hello, I'm Jason Harris. I'm behind GeekSpiff and I publish through Unsanity and I mostly do theme stuff. I'm the author of Shapeshifter and Theme Park and Mighty Mouse, not the mouse, the mouse changing <laughs> software. <laughs> and uh, I also am the project maintainer for Chicken of the VNC, the open source VNC viewer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm Paul Kafasis. I'm one of the co-founders of Rogue Amoeba Software. Uh, we make a bunch of different audio software, Audio Hijack, Audio Hijack Pro, NiceCast, Airfoil. Uh, and yeah, that's about it. Mm -hmm. I'm Will Shipley. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Delicious Monster. And I'm pretty much all there is left of Delicious Monster at this point. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm the founder of the Omni Group, and uh, I make, uh, right now I make Delicious Library, but I was also responsible for Omni Web, Omni Grapple, a little bit of Omni Outliner, Omni PDF, uh, and a bunch of other Omni things. Omni Grapple. <laughs> um, I'm Brent Simmons. I have uh, an app called Net Newswire and another app called Mars Edit, uh, an RSS reader and a weblog editor. Net what? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, net, net, no, I forget. <laughs> net news, yeah. net, net news, net gator, was it? Yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> hey, I'm Jonathan Wolf Wrench, and uh, probably the thing that's public that you know about me is the Mock Override and Mock Eject stuff. But I also got to say that, you know, it was OmniGraffle that made me think, was the first app I used that I thought that, you know, maybe these next guys aren't crazy and they actually have something good. And so, I, you know, OmniGraffle rocks. So you get double pause there. For <laughs> Um, Nick Jitkoff, I work for Blacktree. I'm developer of Quicksilver. Quicksilver! Yeah. Hi, my name is Bob Frank. Um, I help run the local Coco and Wild <laughs> Okay, I shouldn't plug other user groups. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's around, we meet at the Apple Store on the first uh, Tuesday of every month at 6 o'clock. And uh, I've also written Log for Coco, which was an uh, alpha. Uh, port of log for j and my day job I work for uh, Apple thank you hi uh, I'm Eric Payton. I uh, uh, used to do this thing called epicware where I used to write some software I've been working for Apple for about seven years now I write uh, I've written a, uh, 30 or 40 of the apps that are shipped on OS 10 over the past few years and frameworks and all that kind of stuff so It's a pretty big group. Um, <laughs> and in fact, a lot of these guys put themselves out here on their own dime. It's a pretty cool thing. And they're all, they've all kind of contributed to making the Mac pretty damn cool. I mean, they, without their apps, the Mac just would be, it would lose a little bit of its luster. And they're all, at some point, have been fairly independent, although some of them have joined the mothership. Um, yeah, to, that so. end, yeah, to that end, we're going to kind of start it off and plant a little seed topic here to end the conversation and ask, what is the hardest part about being a small Mac developer? Becoming a small Mac developer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, elaborate. What do you mean by becoming a small Mac developer? Well, the transition from having a day job to supporting yourself is really rough. Um, when, when I decided to actually go for it and uh, and you know, try and do this for real. I got down to where all of my credit cards were maxed. My bank balance was five dollars. All of my bills were a month overdue, and you know that's a scary situation to be in. Has and that improved? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Bare barely. So it's freaky, you know. And actually, tr deciding to try and do it is very, very scary. It's a tough call to make. Is that something other people here can relate to, or? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, Paul, I'm not a very good developer. <laughs> Paul is somebody who, you've grown your business very slowly over time, right? Yeah, well, everybody started out uh, when uh, I was still in school, I was still in college, and Quentin, uh, one of our co-founders, was still in college. Uh, and it, needed, it didn't need to be a full-time job at that time. Uh, so the growth was slow and steady, and eventually it got to a point where we could be full-time. But we certainly didn't get to a situation where uh, our credit score was dropping rapidly. Uh, <laughs> I would say the answer to that question, uh, Brent will uh, Brent will know my answer, uh, is doing everything yourself, including things like health insurance, uh, handling just about everything yourself, uh, handling every aspect of running the business instead of working for a company like Apple, where you're you're able to do the work, I assume, but you don't have to worry about paying anybody or uh, you know just all the sort of things that have to do with running the business as opposed to just developing software. Uh, you can create a, you can create an application and put it out there. And just as a hobby, and that's great. But to turn it actually turn it into a business takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money. I agree with that completely. Writing code is easy. Doing tech support sucks, and it's very hard. <laughs> and I, I I don't have a small um, software project for the Mac community, but before joining Apple, I had a small dot com that uh, didn't make it. So I can talk about not making a small business work. <laughs> um, it's it's you know surprisingly. Like I said, it's easy to focus on writing code, but 
it's a heck of a lot harder to focus on getting money. You need to focus on getting cash and taking care of your customers. And being a geek, it was very hard to, you know, to translate from working on the product or working on the website to going out and trying to sign up customers. And if you're going to make it on your own, you've got to have money coming in or you've got to have someone funding you or you have to have a day job. Well, I'll bring the, I think I'm the, actually, yeah, I'm the only independent consultant here on the, on the panel, so I'll talk about the independent consultant angle that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of easier for us because if you're a successful independent consultant, you can, you can have, like, the PC work, which, is, of course, is never ending <laughs> because it's just, you know, hell. Um, but uh, with, the, with the Mac stuff, you know, you can, you can take these small Mac jobs and you can uh, and, and tweak your skills and keep on building it up until you, you basically get to the point where I'm at, I'm at where I, I didn't, haven't, done, haven't done PC stuff in years. And thus the Mac stuff just keeps me busy all the time, which is great. Um, and, but, you know, that said, it's also nice to have the PC experience because people come to you with PC problems uh, and integration issues and you can say, hey, I, I can cover both platforms where you have a lot of the PC guys can't say that. So that, that helps your marketing right there. Omni actually started as a consulting company back in 90, whatever, two, 91, 93. And uh, we were actually primarily consulting until uh, 99. And it's, it is a good way to get started up in the business. Um, it, uh, if you're a consultant, you can make a lot of money. Uh, you know, you can bill from 150 to 200 an hour if you get a reputation. And that funds a lot of, you know, time spent writing other apps. Uh, until one hits, so it's it's certainly something I would recommend if you want to be independent is find a consulting gig. Um, we work for you know Macaw Cellular, Toyota, Apple, uh, basically you know any big company you can name. We were we were there, um, and it was really great. So I I think it's a good way to go. And it's only recently that that Omni said no more consulting at all, and no more game ports and no more anything like that. But that was what totally started us off. Well, how did you get those customers? I mean, if you, it's easy to kind of set yourself up as a consulting business, but you see these guys on the mailing list all the time saying, I will, will work for Coco. Um, how do you get a gig consulting for Apple? Uh, I think I, I'm probably, I mean, the same way you get any other job, which is you make sure people know your name and the right people know your name. Um, you know, it's all about if somebody says to somebody else, I'm looking for a Mac developer, you know, who's at the top of their head? And the people who are active on the, you know, in the community, the people who uh, are always posting sample code and answering questions and kind of doing interesting things, those are the people that get uh, hired and recommended. Um, it's just like in the gaming community, you see all these people making these, these mods for free, and it's just the smartest thing ever. You know, just 100% of them go on to get jobs in gaming with gaming companies. And so it's just, it's never wasted effort to, to just do stuff, to just get your stuff out there. Well, I hear that a lot. You know, a lot of people come to me and say, well, how do I get a job doing what I do? And you guys, don't, most, most of you don't know me, but I work remote for Apple. There aren't a lot of people that work remote for Apple. Everyone's like, well, how the hell did you get that job? That's a great job. You get to work for Apple. You get to live someplace that doesn't cost you $900,000 for like a one car garage with, you know, 1,200 square feet and a 5,000 square foot lot. And uh, the only way that people know who you are is you got to get out there and you got to push. You got to be on the lists. You got to get your name out there. You got to do stuff that people see. People ask me all the time, well, you know, I, I got this job and I was doing Coco stuff and then I lost the job because, you know, it, the consulting ended. And what am I going to do? How am I going to find stuff? Write an app. Do something. Get it out there. Let people see what, what you've got. Because if people don't know who you are, your resume just slides in the pile. If the name is there and somebody's going to catch it, that's how you can start catching these consulting gigs. That's how you can get the job with a big company that's you know, maybe got a Mac OS 10 port of some old OS 9 software or Windows game or whatever. Um, but if, if your name is just another name and your resume really just looks like, well, I got out of college. I did two years of Mac development for some little consulting firm, mainly web stuff. Yeah. It's not gonna, it doesn't catch the eyes. How do you think open source factors into that? Open source, it's huge. It's absolutely enormous. Um, I used to, I was the second member of the Darwin team. Um, back when it was just Fred Sanchez, Fred and I worked together. So I was by default the second member of the Darwin team. And a way, a, a lot of the names started coming in was, well, this guy's doing this. He's involved in this. 
let's talk to him about how we can get that onto our platform because there was a lot of stuff that you know, we wanted to get on the Mac. And you know, eventually some of those people have gotten hired or consulting gigs or whatever, mainly because of the fact that they've been out there and they've been contributing stuff. And truthfully, you know, this, is, this has nothing to do with Apple or anything like that. If I can see your code, I'm a lot more apt, and I, I, I bet anybody here would be, agree with me, I'm a lot more apt to, to even consider hiring. Show me the code. Show me the code. Let me see what's going on. Let me see how you've done. I mean, Will's blog is all about this. Show me the code. If, if, you, can, if you can show me this stuff, and you can show that you can you know, come up with something innovative or new or something that's just good. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, we can all admit, there's a lot of people out there that write bad code. It doesn't matter who you work for. Um, you show me bad code that's gotten better, and I'll be more impressed. You show me good code that's gotten great, and I'll be very impressed. I'd imagine that Wolf is a pretty good example of this. I mean, as you said, most people know him for Mock yeah, Inject. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I mean, that's a gigantic advertisement. He's bad and he's bad. <laughs> that's pretty much your entire advertisement, isn't it? I yeah. mean, no, nobody has any idea what other projects you've done yeah. except they involve big companies and we probably yeah. use it every day. Yeah, yeah no one knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go ahead and jump back. Yeah. You mentioned blogs. How important are blogs becoming to developers? To small independent developers, are they important? Are they ancillary or? No, they're already. The ship has landed. I mean, <laughs> uh, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, well, look, uh, obviously, look at this panel. Obviously, we're biased to the group, right? Because this is all this is blog-driven conference. But I mean, you know, uh, it used to be this pretty much it was mailing and Usenet, right? And uh, blogs have added this voice to the, the the Uber developers, the guys who. Who not only can can you know respond to a posting on a mailing list, but guys that actually you know have their own thoughts and and can comment. And so long as you know you don't go off like on the political wild woods there, I'm going to keep reading. You. <laughs> <And> <laughs> our, our our advertising budgets are fairly small, and blogs are free publicity. So you know that right there, they're vital. They're absolutely completely vital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I uh, I'm not sure actually. Um, I mean, I track my, my sales and, and my hits on my main site pretty closely, and I haven't found a lot of correlation between the main site and uh, the blog. If I say something controversial on the blog, I don't see like a little spike in sales, which, you know, if I did, every day it'd be like, yeah, I had sex with Paris Hilton. Yeah. <laughs> Twice. Oh, yeah. She's a man, you know. You but I might, I might, I might write about unit testing. Which <laughs> no, no one seems to understand. Um, Actually, yeah. Uh, let's let's back up here. Who wants to explain the unit testing deal that, that was just alluded to? I think Will has the mic. Something to do with the units? Okay. Well, I I I made a post on my blog about unit testing. Um, well, just to give you a little background, Will had said some things that weren't too flattering about what? Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, Huh? <laughs> okay, okay. Well, about unit testing and how he doesn't use it and everything, he develops things a little bit differently. But then a bunch of other people came along and said, hey, we, this is how we use it. And um, I guess the big con... Can we back up and say, what is unit testing? Oh. How would you explain Okay, it? yeah, that's a good start. Um, <laughs> unit, unit testing is a test driven... Well, I write a little program to test my program. And since the computer always, you, uh, most of the time, executes everything the same way, um, it's going to... If anything breaks that I wrote, already that I'm already testing, I'm going to find out right away. So I've got a, in my little application, VoodooPad, I've got a little parser that you type and it creates email links and web links and stuff like that. And it's pretty sensitive. And uh, so I wrote a suite of tests. And if I go in there and change my code, I can run, you know, 70 different tests against it. And then if everything's still working good, you know, I can go ahead and ship this. If something little breaks, I'll know right away. So that's what unit testing is about, at least as far as I use it. The, you, so. It sounds like what you're describing is system testing, though, actually. Unit testing, the classical definition of unit testing, and the reason, the thing I was railing against wasn't system testing, it was unit testing. And unit testing is every method, you say, this method takes an array, removes the first item, and then returns the array. So I'm going to document that, and then I'm going to write a program that's going to test that when I call that method, sure enough, it still removes the first item and returns the array by passing in various little things. That's the thing that I think is entirely useless. Yeah. I don't think system testing is useless. I think it's great. I love it. The, the, what, I, what I don't like is unit testing, which is testing each tiny micro unit. Because generally, micro units are written correctly. And if they're not written correctly, you figure it out really fast. The overall system is a great thing to test. And there's been this huge misunderstanding where people thought I was saying, 
oh, automated testing always sucks. What I'm saying is automated testing of units is a bad idea. It's an incredible waste of time. But, but I think, you know, if you can write a regression test that's automated, great, awesome. That's a wonderful thing. So that's a system test. So I think we're agreeing, actually. Uh, pro yeah, I, probably. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> there goes the show. No. You're all wrong. You're all wrong. We don't test at all. No testing. No testing is the best testing. Yeah, you work well, for Apple, right? Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get mail on that one. Um, we yeah, me too. <laughs> actually, Anyone have any openings? Yeah. <laughs> Will. I, I could interview you and you could get rehired. <laughs> <laughs> is testing becoming harder as software becomes more complex? Is making stable hardware, or I'm sorry, is making stable software becoming harder? Making but stable software has always been yeah. incredibly hard. I mean, if you, I mean, you got to remember, the most complex software any of us have written here is still no more complex or is still significantly less complex than software written in the 70s to, you know, put people in space. And the testing is still testing, and, the, and software is still incredibly complex. Now, there are things that make software easier. And those are like the development tools that we use. There, there's a reason that people, one-man shops, can write really big apps on this platform. It's because you know, some people spent a lot of time working on the lower level stuff. Now, I'm not going to say there's not bugs. And no one's going to say that you know, everything's perfect. But writing software has always been hard. Testing software has always been hard. Any little thing you can do to make it easier generally has a pretty big impact. Because that's just one less thing that you as an independent developer or me as a, as a developer sitting down and writing you know, software in my free time or whatever has to deal with. But I don't think it's gotten necessarily any harder because the systems underneath them have gotten harder. It's just always been hard. I would say that software writing has gotten considerably easier. Um, thus, I mean, just compare the Mac OS 9 days of Carbon. It, 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 significant amounts of effort have been taken away, and that's a great thing. Um, I, well, actually, let me qualify that. I would say that software writing, e the difficulty of writing software has not gotten easier, but the, because it was actually pretty easy in the early 80s. It's just those platforms were not widespread. Instead, what you see is the ideas that were f found. Uh, yeah, the those platforms are pretty simple. Yeah. Well, you, you, what you're seeing here is that you're seeing, uh, especially now that machines are getting faster and faster, you, get, you can throw things like virtual machines and garbage collection things. These type of technologies they've been around forever, but now they're going mainstream. So uh, they haven't gotten easier, but the technologies that that they weren't widespread. So those technologies are becoming more and more widespread. So in effect, it has gotten easier for the, the vast majority of programmers. And one more comment about unit testing. Specifically, one thing that... <laughs> hey, wait a minute. We get, we're done with that. Move on, move on, move on. No, no, no. Come on, come on. Come on. It, it, the specifically, building up your unit test suite so that you can use it for regression testing, when you change something and it breaks something you've already written, that is something that the tools are getting very good at automating. So you can have that built up. And when you continue to move forward, you don't need to worry about it. You have confidence in the code you've already written. That's something that I think is making development easier. And one of the problems with software getting easier to write is that it allows developers to write a lot more complex software, which completely negates any kind of positive effect you get from writing, from making software easy to write. <laughs> you just... Or I, something like that. <laughs> yeah. That's true, but there are a couple of factors that are making it easier. Um, the APIs in the operating system are taking care of a lot more stuff than they used to take care of. As I don't remember who said it, but whoever made the comment about carbon in the OS 9 days, you had to do a lot more yourself as a programmer. And now most of that stuff is done for you. And you can assume that it's generally bug free, not 100% obviously, but pretty bug free. Uh, I think DB is not agreeing with me on that one. <laughs> I, I would say that. that going? <laughs> I, I would say though that uh, OS 10 and Cocoa has made um, you know the success I've had possible. I you know back in the uh, Carbon days, it wouldn't happen. It was just too much work. You know I well, couldn't have done that. Well, you started programming with Cocoa, right? Um, no, I've I've been programming longer than Cocoa. Okay. Yeah. Well, what do you do as a small developer when you do find a bug in Apple's code? How is that handled? I, I usually tell Drunken Batman about it. <laughs> <laughs> or DB, I guess. We'll go with the short version. Um, 
And you post a bug, you tear your hair out, uh, you figure out you know, how bad it's killing your app, and uh, kind of go from there. Work and around and it. And then you work you around to. it. Yeah. Is, from what we've seen, at least, is that uh, it's often very difficult to uh, track down exactly what the problem is. And you can know that there's a problem, but you can only spend so much time trying to figure out what it is before that time would not be better spent doing it yourself. So certainly there are, there are bugs in all the APIs that Apple has out there. And a lot of them are great, and they work well enough that you can use them for everything. But when there are problems with it, uh, I don't think that there's a great dialogue between developers and Apple as far as getting things fixed. And I'm not sure that there could be a better dialogue. But I think that the way it is now, that I, I'm not sure how many people would agree with me, but that working around it is often a better solution than actually trying to uh, get it fixed. Mm -hmm. Because fixes roll out once every six or eight weeks at best. And it usually is going to take a lot more time to get it fixed than that. You can work around it and release it yourself in two, three days or a week or so. So in terms of what you can do about it, uh, I think we're limited by the way that Apple develops and re uh, releases their own updates. You mean commercially versus, say, a lack of open source or? How, well, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Well, when you say the way that they develop their software, do you just mean the timetables, or do you well, mean the fact that you can't actually go in and see what the actual problem is? Uh, I think a little bit of both. Timetables is a big part of it, because like I said, if, if, you're, if you know something's going to be fixed in 10.5, that's great. But if you need to release your software before the end of 2006, that's not going to help you very much. And not only that, but you know, if you wait for Apple to fix the bugs instead of working around them yourself, then you're forcing your customers to only use the most current version of the operating system, and you lose a lot of business by doing that. Uh, I, uh, I sort of agree and disagree. Actually, I disagree, disagree, and disagree. But in the end, I sort of agree. <laughs> with, with, with who? Uh, everyone. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, most recently, I don't think, actually, I think forcing your customers to use the latest operating system is just a good idea in general. Um, market research I've seen says basically the people who buy software buy uh, Apple software. So if you want to sell to people who have money, then go ahead and release to the latest version of the operating system because those are the people that are spending money on the computers and the rest of the people aren't. You know, the first thing they're going to spend money on is Tiger, not your app. So, you know. You can sort of get the, <coughs> you can get the corner of the cheapskate market if you want. I'm all with you guys making everybody upgrade their apps to the next version <laughs> of the operating system. Yeah. Well, hold I mean, on, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about forcing customers to stay on 10.2. I'm talking about not forcing customers to upgrade from 10.4.2 to 10.4.3. I see, yeah. No, I, I, well, I mean, except, I, I don't know. I, I sort of, since that's a free upgrade, it seems like it's, it's not an unreasonable thing to, to requ request to them. And customers are always completely reasonable. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I, that's, that's the thing, is it's just, it's just so easy. I, I, it just hasn't been a big issue for me at all, you know, being but able but to say things like this. But it is a barrier to entry. I, yeah, but I mean, it's not like this is, I, I guess what I'm saying is in my experience, it hasn't been a barrier that's, that's hurt <coughs> me very much. Um, I've, I've definitely, I've always said, you know, if, if Apple fixes the bug, I'm not fixing <coughs> it. Uh, you know, if, if you can just get a software update, click a button and get the bug fixed, then, then you do that, and I'm not going to. Uh, and and that hasn't really bit us. Um, even being 10.3 only didn't bite us very much at all. There were you know maybe three customers out of, well I can't really give the numbers, but out of a lot of customers, there's only like maybe three who said you know oh you know dang 10.3 dang, and the rest just went okay we'll upgrade whatever. But there's there's still cases where you have to do workarounds. I can give you a really good example. 10.4.0 uh, had a very serious bug. It, the new tech system they had lists where you could have lists. You use it, you save it. Next time you open it up, everything below your list is gone. So is for my application, I had to put a, a workaround in, um, see if you're on 10.4.0 and, and 10.4.1, I think, also. Um, strip out those list components and just stick in regular bullet points, you know. Because that's, that's a serious issue. Someone just installs, you know, a 10.4.0 and it's like, oh, I got to put Voodoo Pad on there, open stuff up, save, and then <gasps> it's gone. You know, I, I got to work around that. You no, know? absolutely. And, and that's, that was sort of the agree, disagree thing was, um, Apple's release cycle is more like six months or a year. I mean, I've never really had them fix a major bug in a minor release. I guess maybe most of my bugs are too big for that. But um, so when I send off a bug, I know I'm not going to see any results for a year or a year and a half. Um, so I'm simultaneously working a workaround. But to answer the original question, what do I do when I get a bug? I spend a day writing a, a tiny program that demonstrates the bug unequivocally. And I package it up and I file uh, radar bug, 
And uh, generally, the engineers write me and say, you know, thanks for the bug. We're glad you're using this subsystem. Here's, you know, something you might try. Uh, so I think it's, you know, I think there, there's a tone issue. I mean, there may be a, you know, a, a, a famous name issue, but I think there's also, you know, if you sort of come at them one way, it's, it's one thing, and if you come out another way and say, hey, this is great, I think I found this bug, can you help me? Then you're gonna get a, a pretty reasonable response. These guys want their stuff to work. It's their job, if their frameworks don't work, they're gonna be fired, so, you know, if you're their ally, then, then, then they're very happy to work with you. And writing a good bug with a reproducible test case is very good. Thank you. Well, as a, as a counter anecdote, maybe I don't file good bugs, but I do the exact same thing. I, I isolate it and write a very small test case, and I uh, include that with my bug report. And I never have heard a single word back on any bug that I've ever filed. Who are you again? <laughs> I'm fun sort of, not I don't think you will either. <laughs> I think you might have actually touched on this on your site at one point, uh, talking about the interaction that developers have with Apple as far as uh, bug reporting goes. Uh, and I'm not sure how many people actually have any idea how many people use uh, uh, <coughs> use the bug reporting that Apple provides. But even uh, developers, uh, ADC members, don't really get a lot of interaction. Uh, we file a bug, and it gets a status. And it's open. It's reproducible. There's a few other statuses. But it can just be listed as closed duplicate. And you'll never hear anything back on it until t in 10.5 you realize it's been fixed, or it still isn't fixed. Uh, so I think there's definitely sort of a, uh, a disconnect between <laughs> developers who are submitting bugs and then how, Apple, how Apple's system deals with that. How would you compare that to, say, Microsoft, which has seemed to be trying to transition to a system where more and more of their bug databases are actually online, similar to the way uh, web cores is? Is that something that is necessary? Is that something that you look fondly at? Is that something? Oh, that developers have been asking for a long time to make ra radar, at least ra that's Apple's internal bug tracking system, at least somewhat transparent. That the ability to say, I'm filing this bug and I want to make it public. Because uh, the, the typical thing is that you go to Apple and say, hey, it would be really great if radar were public. And they say, well, there's secrets in there. You can't, we can't do that. So wouldn't it be nice if the developers could say, when I'm filing a bug, I want the world to know this. Secrets as in, say, private source code. Private source code, uh, you know, uh, or whatever, you know. So, uh, kernel bugs, that's a good example. Or, you know, security breaches, for example. Yeah. How many of those have we filed? So it's, you know, it's, <coughs> and uh, we've been asking for this for at least five years now. And it's, 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 I don't know if it's just fallen deaf ears or what. If I recall correctly, I believe that the Darwin project had an open source radar component for a while. Someone else who's been more involved with Darwin might want to correct me. But I believe that they had to <laughs> fix, <laughs> I believe they had to fix, um, they, they had to stop that because it was difficult for, man, it was a, it was a personnel, there were too many constraints on people's time and what they could write in one bug versus what they could write in another bug. And I think that it was difficult for everybody to keep public or private, to keep everything straight. If I recall correctly, and I think it was reported in several blogs at the time, but I'm not sure. And um, you know, now they've spun it off in the Darwin Project is completely on its own. And that's you know, one way uh, to handle that. Oh, and can I digress for one second? One way to write a better bug, by the way, is to include some impact data. So you, know, you say, you know, why, why is it an important bug for you? Uh, just break something. Oh, and here's a test case. That's, that's a good bug. Or data loss. But if you can write the impact on, you pro on your product and your customer base, I think that would help write better bugs for you guys. Well, let's back up here a second and go back to where you said customers are always unreasonable. As small Mac developers, <laughs> <laughs> are you ever actually afraid of your customers? Do you have to carry yourself in a different way than you might otherwise do if you were, say, developing for Windows? Well, um, I, I don't. Uh, uh, carry myself in a different way than if I were developing for Windows, but uh, the sheer number of people who uh, want to interact can be frightening once you have a successful product. I mean, I find myself spending tons of time, uh, hours a day, uh, looking at people's web logs who, who have mentioned my product, and you know they want to hear something. You know, they and and they're right to want to. Um, you know, the whole markets are conversations thing, but uh, the fear just comes in the vast amount of time it takes away from programming. Um, so that's a, a tricky thing. 
Uh, and also, of course, there is you know some diplomacy involved. I mean, I can't you know uh, write about my porn addiction, uh, <laughs> you know, because uh, I'm going to lose half my sales or or whatever. Yeah, you know, so you know, as much as I want to write about it. <laughs> and we want to hear. Go ahead. Uh, shift, shift. Oh wait, actually, let's um, go. I found it's really easy to fall into worrying about what every single person wants, and it, it, Mac users specifically are very active and will tell you what they think it should look like and you have to sort of weigh them all against each other and try to get a group opinion and it it's nice to have all the input but it's just it can become it can take control if you're not careful but that's the benefit of being a small developer you're in control chip was going to hurt somebody if he doesn't get the mic here in a second yeah you, well you know i i have to fight the babes off so that's a big <laughs> i actually travel with my bodyguard who's here in the audience tonight so <laughs> was, his, is, was it his responsibility to get you here on time? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Yeah, there were security problems coming in, and you know we had to clear the corridor. But uh, I've never programmed for anything but essentially Mac people. I mean, Next people back in the old days. So I don't really have anything to compare them to. But I certainly, I mean, I like the activism, and that's, that's something I've touched on many times. Is uh, I don't think I could survive in the Windows world. I don't think I would uh, have any money at all, honestly. I would be, you know, yet another uh, Vizio ripoff uh, competing for attention, you know, 10 years ago. Because uh, there's like seven of them out there for Windows, you know, Vizio ripoffs. And, and they are, you know, some of them are on the shelves and none of them are making any money. Uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about crapware. Uh, any, any niche you can name on Windows has uh, 12 different apps for it. Uh, uh, you want to redo your kitchen? There's, there's 13 or 14 apps that have shipped over the last you know, seven years. Uh, they all suck. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if I wrote one tomorrow that was the world's best, what, what, what would I do? I'd go, to, I'd go to CompUSA and I'd say, I've got this great software. They'd say, who are you? I'm not talking to you. I'd say, who are you talking to? They'd say, Navar. I'd go, OK. Hey, Navar, i got this great software. They'd say, who are you? I'd say, I'm a software guy. They'd say, we don't talk to you. You have to make at least a million dollars a year if I talk to you. I'd say, okay. So I'd go to an aggregator and say, hey, aggregator, I got this great idea. And they'd say, great, 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 great. We'll only take 20% to get you Navarro, who's going to take another 15%. Then we're going to sell it to CompUSA 50% off. Now, every quarter, CompUSA is going to take 20% for an advertising budget. Now, what does that leave you with? <laughs> <laughs> but the box costs 450 to print. And if you want the end caps, well, that costs extra. So it's like, uh, you can't survive in that market. I don't. You know, yeah. I'd, I'd love to see a similar gathering of Windows developers. Well, why is Apple still making hardware then? I mean, it's, it seems almost, the what you just described, almost just to sound pretty much like what Dell is doing to the hardware market. I don't understand the question. <laughs> that's that's perfectly that? fine. I don't follow that. What's that? I don't think any of us That's it. fine. That's perfectly <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Did I mention this is being recorded? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. It's over there. Uh, hey guys, uh, an easier question for you guys, especially the Mac guys there, the second one from DB. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the development tools that you said that can uh, simplify things, like unit testing, or, uh, regression testing, stuff like that, just so we have an idea of what we can use instead of going to the route? I was just talking about unit testing in general. If you build up your unit test suite, Okay, so you're building your application, your framework, or whatever it is, particularly good for frameworks, okay? You're building up um, you know, your unit tests as you're building up functionality into your framework. If you add more features in the future, or you um, make a change to your code, and you're, running your, uh, bu you're building your application or your framework, your unit tests, you know, if you change something and break it, will let you know, hey, you broke this. That's my point about regression, to, uh, okay, preventing I heard, regression. I thought you mentioned something about tools and coming from Apple. I was wondering, you know, yeah. what kind of stuff well, we can look at. Well, X well Xcode 2.1 now has unit testing built in, so that helps. Oh, sorry, that was my premise. You know, Xcode 2.1 has, you know, OC unit built in. I was wondering if there's anything else that you guys were thinking no, or. I wasn't thinking, I was just being very blatant and obvious. <laughs> Thanks. So. Of course, I, I think if you're writing frameworks, you, you're probably making a mistake anyway. So <laughs> that's another one of my assertions. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I've got three applications. The only reason I have three applications is because I share code between all of them. And I've got a single framework where I put that code and I put those tests, and it, it helps out enormously. One guy 
one framework, three apps. It works out really, really, really well. Oh, so. I think I think shared code is awesome. I just don't think a framework is actually the right way to do shared code. I mean, because you're not actually installing the framework in the system, right? You actually install it as a sub. Yeah, as a sub part of so my application. So you copy the same framework three times on the user system. Sure. Which is, and then frameworks have to be, you know, independent, like position independent, and so they're larger, they're slower to load, and they contain a bunch of extra resources that you don't need in each app. Slower to load on a quad G5, you know, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Well, if your whole market is quad G5s, I guess that's great for you. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, that's, I don't see a performance problem. I, there at one point I was not using frameworks, and then I switched to frameworks. And what I were you using saw, before? I was using, just compiling the M files in, so. You mean copy and pasting code between your apps? No, no, it'd be the same. Well, well sharing the .c files. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. Give myself away. <laughs> <laughs> what I like about frameworks is that it allows you to, to concentrate on uh, what, what you're working on. I have uh, a few different frameworks that I share between my apps, and it's, for me, it's almost just kind of a, uh, a mental help uh, to yeah. say, okay, now I'm working on my XML stuff. I'm working on my XML framework. And, uh, you know, so it's a Could we back up a second here and actually say what a framework is? I'm not sure that a lot of people actually caught what a framework <laughs> actually is and how it applies to your programming. Sure, right. it's uh, essentially a, uh, a bundle of code that is not compiled into the app, um, exists separately on disk. Uh, but then the application uh, loads it and uses that code. One of the nice things about a framework, as opposed to just including your source file in, is that you can, especially since Xcode is so slow with compiling and linking and whatnot, you can have it as a separate, self-contained little happy little framework and not worry about it while you're working on the big project. It links into that, it gets all this message from it, you know that code is safe you know that nothing you do in the main app is going to break or change that code. So you test it thoroughly, you make sure it works, and then you include it in your big app. It doesn't matter that it takes up more space. It doesn't matter that it may make a few hundred milliseconds difference in loading. It's, it's better for the user and the developer in the long run. It probably does speed up the development process just in that it's sight out of mind. You know, you write the framework, once the framework is done, the framework is done, and you aren't thinking about that code anymore, as Brent said. And it may cause a performance impact. It does cause a performance impact, but it's probably a fairly negligible one. And the benefit to the code development process, you know, you end up with a better, more stable app. It probably would outweigh the performance hit, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah I mean, the performance is really secondary for me, but what I've discovered is, and I've done it both ways, I mean, you know, uh, Omni Outkit, Omni Foundation are some of the probably most famous open source foundation frameworks out there. Uh, and they're huge and they're bloated. And uh, there's a bunch of classes that uh, aren't used anymore, but no one really knows that they're not used because who knows? I mean, Omni shipped four apps on the same frameworks. Uh, actually, it was like six when you count the other ones. Um, and, you know, when you get to that many apps, you don't really know on any given method, like, can I change the interface on this, or am I breaking all our apps? And... Well, would you say that's a knock against fr uh, frameworks or a knock against the design? You know, you, you just, they grew and they grew and they grew. That's not necessarily a knock against frameworks well, in general. Well, no, but I just think frameworks make it really easy to, as they say, sort of take this bunch of code, bundleize it, put it over here, and then, and then stop thinking about it. And what I've discovered is... is you know, I, my, my rule on making a framework is uh, I only make a framework like the, the second time I use any particular piece of code, not the first. And what most programmers do is they think very, like, sort of obsessed and compulsively. And so they'll say, oh, well, I need some utilities to deal with strings. I'll make a string framework. It'll be great. And we'll put up a barn and we'll have a play. And, and so they're like, <laughs> so they create this class and they'll be like, oh, and it should take input and output and I'll write a unit test and I'll do this and I'll do this and I'll do this. And I'll have it so it handles all these cases perfectly. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't have an app yet. You just spent all your time running a damn string framework. Congratulations. Sure, the most important thing is to get the app to run and get it to work. But, you know, having a framework, you know, everybody's here has had their own, you know, good and bad points about it. But I think you're right. Don't spend time over-engineering up front. But it can be very useful down the road. Gus, um, so when you created your framework that you use across your applications, did you actually start with the framework and then build the app? No, I didn't no, think so. No. You, you probably started with the app, then you said, okay, I'm going to write this other app, 
and it's going to share this common code. Right. The way it worked is I wrote Voodapad first, and then I um, started writing Flysketch, which is a little drawing application. And uh, there was code in Voodapad that I wanted to use over here. Well, I'll start writing a framework out of that. So that's the way I did it. Yeah. So you're, if you're going to start with a framework and start doing it like Will's going to do, you're, you're not disciplined, and you're not going to ship that app anyway. Yeah. So we're going to switch over here to another user question. Hey, guys. Um, I actually had a another question, but since you got on the topic of frameworks. No. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the things that, I, that nobody's touching on with frameworks is that they allow you to. Put the mic up. It, was, it is yeah. on. It's, it's quiet. Is it? OK. Yeah, All right. I think one of the things that no one touched on with frameworks is that they allow you to dynamically load your code at runtime for various operating systems. For example, I had a project where I had to support people, or I had to at least be able to identify people who didn't have the WebKit framework installed. And without like a framework or without a dynamically loadable library, that wouldn't have been possible because I'd have been linking to the symbols at compile time. So I think that's one advantage that no one's kind of touched on, and I think well, that Apple's frameworks are one thing. I'm just saying, if you're a user or you're a, you're an independent programmer, uh, I just caution against using frameworks. I think it's a, it's, 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 it, it leads you down the wrong path. Not that they're inherently bad, but that it's, it's a convention that sort of leads toward dead code. Oh, uh, well, okay. Then back to the question I was going to originally ask. <laughs> What um what kind of version control software do you guys use? I personally use Subversion. Are there, are, okay, there are some thumbs up. Uh, is there like, I mean, I haven't really like looked at any of the commercial packages. I know that I shouldn't. Okay, all right, well. <laughs> Especially, and this is for the record, do not look at Perforce. Okay, okay. all right. I, I was just wondering because Subversion is the thing that I have the most experience with. It's free. But are there ones that I should look into? Because if I go to a company and they're like, "Oh, we use this for version control," is there like a, is there a, like one? I know Apple uses a proprietary one. I think. Well, it depends or, on what part of Apple. Oh, like okay. there are chunks of Apple that use CVS. There's chunks of Apple that use Subversion. Um, you know, and if you do go to another company, they probably will have sucky version control. That's almost you know that's like eighty percent chance. Oh. I don't know why <laughs> why companies that's all don't go to Subversion, but. They seem to like to want to spend money on four <laughs> systems. <laughs> they want to be able to get support, too. In, in 10 years, I've never used anything that wasn't CVS or Subversion. Uh, if you want to learn another version control system, it'll take you what, half an hour. Don't worry about it. Use whatever makes you most productive. Does, I'd be interested in knowing if anyone on the panel here is willing to admit that they don't use version control at all. <laughs> I, I'm a little hesitant to admit it, but <laughs> <laughs> zip and DVD. I will, I will admit that I do not use version control consistently, that I will have a bunch of little projects that I do not, you know, one office, like for example, the bug reports. I don't put those in version control. Oh, okay. I build the one little apps. I don't put those in there. Bang. Do you back them up? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I keep backups of everything. Well, all right, let's back up. Why don't, why haven't you used verse con version control? 24 hours in the day. I've just never gotten around to it. And he's never had a major failure. <laughs> yes. when that happens. Well, well there's well, a difference between version control and backup. No, 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 there, I mean, yeah, there's a huge difference. I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, there's a huge difference. <laughs> no, I mean, well, yeah, yeah, but yeah. he's saying that he backs everything up. I mean, okay, first of all, I haven't really couched any of this. This is all from me. This has nothing to do with me at wow. Apple or anything like that. Um, but the first time that you make a big change, you go through and you change a whole bunch of stuff, and you go, you compile and run, and your computer just crashes. Absolutely just slams. And you realize that the last backup was three days ago, and two of your files just went off into Netherland. You'll start using version control and checking in every two, two hours or hour and a half or something like that. I, I would imagine that you're probably correct. And that, that's happened to me five times. And wow, you've got talent. Well, I also you know, worked on disk drivers. You know, th those are the things that lose stuff. You know, but I'm just saying, I mean, if you're a developer worth your salt, you're using version control. And I can't believe you're not. 
and backing yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> and backing up. And DVDs and zip files. And you're buying the beer tonight, Rem- too. Remote. I mean, remote backup or whatever. Am, am I going to get voted off the island? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ooga, ooga. I, I know a developer that was so compulsive that he backed up his entire home directory into a subversion control system. Wow, that's that's crazy. There's Steve. actually there's some developers in the audience tonight, and uh, at a at a recent conference or a recent Apple seminar, they uh, I, I looked at their code to see if I could speed it up, and uh, the graphics code, and it was uh, really atrocious. I mean, it was bad. It was really really bad. Thanks, Bob. You're <laughs> And. Uh, and so on I, that note, we're going to so stop here. Got, so I got out a bunch faster, and I'm like, you know, typing, I'm rewriting their code, right? I get a bunch faster, and I just stub out the code, right? I'm just delete this, delete this, delete this. Here's what you want to do. Totally break it, give it to them. Like, it's faster now, but you need to finish it. And the guy's like, well, you delete all my code. I'm like, well, yeah, you just look at what you had and put it in. He's like, no subversion, no version control. I just delete his code. I'm like, well, this is a good lesson for you. <laughs> You've learned two things today. Thank and goodness we'll Xcode has unlimited undo. <laughs> 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 that's, that's what we did. <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to wrap up here for a 10, 12 intermission or so. You guys can go ahead and uh, if you know where the bathrooms are, females that way, males that way, just go up the stairs, take a sharp left. We'll be back here in 12 minutes or so. Thanks. Go ahead and get going here if you guys take your seats, including the participants. (laughs) (laughs) It's nowhere near as close as you know for us. (laughs) Maybe I shouldn't have specified a time. Uh, we're going to, uh, Shipley requested that I give him 30 seconds to give me something on camera. Yes. Yes. Actually, first off, I have to say uh, I, I promised people I'd show them Delicious Library 2 running. So uh, wait. here it is. It's uh, it's it's running. Mail. So we we got the we got you this T-shirt. It uh, that, I think that's the right size, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You can just throw that one into the audience. Did I mention this is being taped? <laughs> <laughs> and we also got you this. Because you're the drunken Batman, we got you this bottle of bourbon. Oh my god, this is the stuffed cow. <laughs> <laughs> is that the song? Now, a lot of you, I'm sure, got dragged here by somebody and they, you know, you see this cow on a couch just kind of looking at you a little strange. And, you know, the, the cow kind of came about because I started kind of getting a lot of traffic and a lot of, a bit of a name. And I had this stupid little cow on the site that really didn't mean anything. I mean, it was just this thing that kind of made me laugh. So when I kind of had to pick a mascot, we just kind of wanted to pick something that was somewhat absurd, somewhat uh, irreverent, and just kind of made me laugh. And David Landham ended up doing it. And you know, I'm th- thank you. That was very, very, very cool. You're welcome. We're going to uh, start off here with a user question. I know we've got one up in the top left here. Um, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'm going to. And I don't have anything against Will, but I'm going to point out that uh, your arguments against frameworks really is an argument for unit testing because you've got big bloated frameworks. I didn't want to mention that. That yeah. you could refactor if you had unit testing to make sure you didn't break anything. So just pointing that out. I, uh, I don't know. I, I've discovered, I mean, coding is, is a continual process for me. And as I said, I mean, at Omni, I was, you know, at, for a time in charge of the frameworks and in charge of maintaining them. Um, I give advice based on my experience uh, shipping apps. When I started this new app, it was divided up into a framework and a main app. And the framework was kind of like, oh, this will handle all the model stuff. And the, the main app was like, this will handle the view and the controller. 
uh, and it just was incredible pain. It's uh, slower to link. Uh, every time you try to debug, it's, it's, it's slower because it loads in the framework separately. Um, it, at the time, there were problems with uh, running GDB with frameworks correctly, although I'm sure those are fixed now. Um, and also there were just all sorts of communication problems between the, the, the model and the controller where there were things, times we wanted to cheat and we couldn't. And we'd end up spending, you know, like days on a workaround. Um, so I got rid of that and just never looked back. It was just the best thing ever. Um, but as I've been programming, uh, I've been, you know, keeping an eye on well, what code do I want to factor out. Uh, and, and what I've discovered is, is it's just very little stuff that I really need to factor out. You know, someone here mentioned an XML framework. And I'm curious about that because I, I, I had some XML handling code. But like when 10.4 came, I just deleted the one class from my uh, app that handles XML and replaced it with NSXML. And, and that was that. Uh, I, 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 I can't imagine having a framework for that. Um, so I guess, I guess the thing is I don't see, I don't have that much like separated, like a whole unit of functionality that I want to separate. And there are certainly classes of apps that have that. And, and I have to be really careful to say, I'm not talking about all software engineering. I'm not talking about writing apps for Toyota. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, making big uh, client server apps. I'm talking about if, if you're making the kind of apps that I have experience with, this is my experience is, I, I think frameworks are a lot more hassle than they're worth and they lead toward uh, dead code just sort of hanging around forever. Uh, whereas if you don't have frameworks, it's really easy to say, wait, I'm not using this file anymore, delete. Oh wait, nobody's using it, delete. And that's, that's that, especially when you're using Subversion. <laughs> now, just, just out of curiosity, what do you think about the scenario where um, your app has some large bit of functionality that's not commonly used? And when it is used, then you load in the framework that handles that bit of functionality. Uh, I, I, uh, I would still have it just in the main app um, because demand paging is gonna is gonna do it for you. Uh, I would I'd make sure to use the compiler options uh, where you can get some locality of code and make sure that uh, that 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 whole thing is is you know situated uh, in the binary next to each other. But I I wouldn't use the framework because that's a bunch of overhead. As soon as you introduce any framework, you have to do all this linking stuff that you just don't have to do if, if you don't have any framework. So it's, it's like We're going to switch off to another question from the audience here. Thank you, DB. Um, we, had, <laughs> we had the Mac Toolbox and Win32 for a long, long time. Then, of course, Next Step, which became Coco and uh, now .NET, we're seeing this move towards these gigantic uh, you know, library shipping with OSs that give you all this functionality and make uh, your lives that much easier. What's going to come next? Uh, you know, we see the rise of Python and Ruby and other dynamic languages to give us some of the power of Objective C and Smalltalk. Oh God, hope there's no sinkhole coming. <laughs> um, and, uh, and and I'm just curious what what you, if you could design Coco plus plus, for lack of a better term, what would it look like? Uh, what would we have? What would the languages be the, you know, wh what kinds of tools would you want to have to build the next generation that would make Coco look like a toy? This is going right to rents. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Sy Syracuse is right, or is he wrong? I forget. You know, I, I, I'm trying to follow <laughs> the comments on that one posting. Uh, I, I, have they reached a verdict? Moving yet? along. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Moving along. Um, yeah, so obviously higher level languages, right? Um, you know, I, I, I agree with Syracuse that garbage collection is a big deal. And it's a big deal for the wrong reasons, but it's still a big deal. And uh, Coco does need it. Um, Objective C is also pretty much a dead end. And you know, it, it hurts me to say that, but you know, from what I can tell, it is. Um, I think so, I've been hearing that for about 12 years now. You know, I knew I would get flack for that, so yeah. that's why I threw it out there. That way, everyone can yell at me. But you know, I I, I, I don't see a future. You're next off this island. Would you, know would you elaborate on that one? <laughs> Would you elaborate on that, Wolf? Oh, uh, would elaborate on what? Objective, objective C being a dead end. Um, if you if you can effectively pull pointers out of Objective C, uh, it may not be a dead end. But to my knowledge, that's been thought uh, impossible. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> I, I can yield the floor. <laughs> No, 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 no. Some, I, some, it's like people are just kind of lining up to go ahead and take <laughs> I, that I on. I, I'm, I'm really not comfortable I've, I've giving been somebody programming uh, for a long time now, <clears throat> for our, you know, my, most of my 23 years, um, <laughs> and uh, every couple of years people are like, well, we need a high-level language that's going to get rid of 
pointers and and they they introduce it and and then C wins out again, and it's just been, it's just amazing uh, how regularly it's been uh, since you know the invention of C where it was like oh uh, modula two now first Pascal then modula two, then the the four GLs were coming uh, then Ada was the standard. Um, and then you know we had all the things from Microsoft and other vendor solutions, and then Java was going to kill it. And every time people go, wait, this sucks. We can't do any real work. Let's go back to language where we can just write it. It works. We're done. And uh, so I, I would, I, my feeling is is, is that this 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 miracle language isn't coming. I, I do you think there's more languages, more software being written today in C? I mean, percentage-wise, do you think C and C plus plus and Objective C that in terms of uh, market share, for lack of a better word? Do you think that, you know, 1989, definitely most software written C, lesser C++. But today, 2005, I think that percentage has shrunk. I think it's been stolen by languages that do not have pointers. The, the Mac toolbox was 84 and it was written in Pascal. Yeah. And, you know, it, as recently as 89, people were still talking about uh, uh, the other one. And then modular 2, and then uh, Ada was shortly thereafter, and it was uh, 87 through 95, the DOD said everything's going to be done in Ada, and everyone right. was saying, oh, Ada, it's great, it's all structured, and it's incredible." But that was all talk. It wasn't actually being backed up. Today, I'm saying that pointer-based languages, I think, are losing market share. And Which market? I, oh, d I, I agree that today, you know, we all our software is pointer-based. I'm not saying... I'm not disagreeing with that. However, the definite trend seems to be, and it's, it's, it's slow. It's chipping away, isn't this, you know? But I see it, see it as inevitable. John, I think you have to look at different markets. You have desktop applications, you have server applications, you have scripting utilities, and so on and so forth. And I think there's a lot of different tool and tool sets that have different niches where they excel. I, I, uh, I'm not dead yet. You know, I think, uh, I think that's a bit premature. But I think it's an interesting point, too. I mean, I like, like, for example, the Cocoa frameworks. I don't think those should be moved off Objective-C anytime soon. That's because Objective-C is dynamic enough that you can put higher level uh, interpreted and runtime languages on top of it. You know, it, it'd be stupid right now, probably for the next five to 10 years to rewrite Cocoa and Objective-C. Uh, I mean, out of Objective-C. Um, <laughs> that wasn't a Freudian slip, let me tell you. Um, but you know, what, what language is next? I, I actually don't know. I, I, you know. In some ways, I hope it's Python. In some ways, I don't. We're going to take another user question here real quick. Uh, one thing about the uh, use the uh, pointer-based languages that Wolf was talking about, I think that in arenas like web apps and stuff like that where it, you don't really need this, it's fallen away. But in arenas where like desktop programming, like uh, Bob was saying, it's C is still the majority. I mean, C is just this monster. You're never going to be able to kill it. Well, one of the big things I've seen. But, so. um, my, my, my real question was, have you guys seen the Oopsla 2005 paper on higher order messaging in Objective-C? What do you think about that? I was initially skeptical, but I read the paper after hearing the hype, and I'm excited. Could you give sort of a As little overview? Actually, yeah. Oh, OK. Um, higher order messaging is a way of addressing collections in kind of like an SQL-ish way, instead of having to f iterate over a, an array or something, you can say, I want to uh, s select all of these and send a message to all of them saying something. Or I want to perform some, op perform some operation on them. I want to bring out all the values from them and add them all together. Or We, we actually had that uh, yeah, quite a while ago. Perform it, uh, it uses that. It uses uh, trampolining and mm. perform perform, uh, make object perform, for perform selector, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, like Fscript has had this for a long time. And Fscript is a great implementation. I use it all the time. I mean, to my, right now, when I want to script Coco, I use Fscript. Even though I'm a PyOpsiga fan, you know, I, it's still, it's not, Fscript fits my brain for scripting Coco better than, than uh, PyOpsy does. And I guess I should actually mention what Fscript is and all that. Uh, is, is go to Fscript.org, it's, it's, it's basically, it's a small talk type language and environment for scripting Coco. So you don't have to write and you don't have to deal with pointers. Um, you can thus create objects, message them, and it also features this thing called higher, higher object messaging, where you can basically, instead of sending, uh, having to iterate an array to send a message to each of the objects it contains, you just can send the message to the array and the runtime will do the right thing. 
Well, so, I think you're, you're kind of getting some arrows here you might not deserve, because the, re the original question, the scope really was what's next. Uh, hold what, on. What's going to be coming out? I well, have one more I comment just before I... was asking about what they thought of it, if they'd read the paper or not. That's, that's all. I like it. <laughs> I, I want to back this up just one it. more second no. to, to, to throw out just my little opinion, which is very small. <laughs> I've worked on a lot of different languages and a lot of different business environments, and I've worked with a lot of languages that got rid of pointers, and every single one of them has had an extension that allowed you to get back to C or get back to pointers. And that's when you know that that language did not fulfill the requirement. When I find a language that actually comes along that is a higher order language that allows all this and gets rid of pointers and does not need or does not cause a development of a extension that allows you to get back to pointers, that's when we'll actually start considering the fact that we actually have something that we can consider a can candidate to be thought of as maybe the next thing. <laughs> but until we get to that, we're always falling back. You see, that, that will never happen because operating systems are written in C. Well, that's the problem is now you need to get to the point where... Exactly, that maybe. is the problem. <laughs> no, but that's not the problem. <laughs> you're the problem. <laughs> There's a good reason they're written in C and C++ and so on. When you can write the operating I, system in the language that doesn't need to be able to get back to that, and I guess you're saying, you know... Uh, there are things, things, things called list machines, right? Yeah, but you could, they had extensions that would allow you to use list to get back to other languages. Right. So a, a language onto itself that is one pure language, then you'll look at it? Well, no, that's not what I'm saying, John. You know what I'm saying. Every single time that somebody's come up with this thing, they end up Java. Oh, yeah, Java, 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 Java. Oh, wait a minute. Ooh, we need to be able to message back to other types of environments. Let's, let's start couching pointers in other objects. And that defeats the purpose. Yeah, it does. It really does. Because then what, what do people end up doing? Oh, I can't figure out how to do it the native way. So let me go get the object pointer to the thing in the other er, in the native language. So let me go get the pointer to the We are delving language. into too much programmer talk. Yeah, we're getting way off. <laughs> OK, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to uh, back off of this. Yeah, speaking right. of consistency, let's talk about UI for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> As developers, where who do you turn to to create usable apps? I turn to God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was on the cover of Time, right? Uh, are you saying John Carasu uh, Five times <laughs> Syracuse. <laughs> <laughs> it always seems that Apple's like the original source for what people try to do, and even though they set up guidelines, it's always them, they're the first ones to break it, and they sort of will lead others to follow their, their brokenness. And it's, I don't know, it's troubling, but it, people are trying to create, com I, there are examples of people trying to create unified interfaces across the OS, and it, it's just tough when Apple wants to create, be able to do something this way and sort of tells other people not to. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the lesson there is, uh, you know, don't listen when they say, don't break the UI guidelines. <laughs> it's all about breaking the UI guidelines. Just, you know, make sure if you do it, you, you do it for better. And I think that's what they're really trying to say. You know, if, if you're going to break them, make sure you've got a dang good reason. Uh, I, I break them all over the place. I mean, 100 places. You know, none of the widgets in Delicious Library are standard. They're all, like, these little custom things with custom icons on them. We, we don't, I don't think we have a single standard button in the entire app. Do and yet we got best user interface. What does that say? <laughs> as, as the guy who writes Shapeshifter, <laughs> <laughs> that is a terrible thing to hear. <laughs> Do you all feel that you're compelled to try to come up with new widgets and stuff just so that you don't look like every other Cocoa app that people have been dumping into the market? Well, one of the best apps are the people that write up here. You know, NetNews Wire is a very, very standard UI. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, it's a great app. We all love it. I think everybody here agrees the fact that it's a great app. And it follows all the conventions. Uh, uh, but, it, but even yeah. still, I, I break a number of, uh, of the interface guidelines. Uh, for instance. But you, do you do them like Will says? For better. I think the app yeah, works I, very I hope well so. because yeah. of that fact. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm perfectly willing to break any rule for better. Yeah. But they're not all independent widgets. But they're not all independent widgets. Either. We have a few custom widgets. A few custom yeah. widgets. Um, but then the other rules, like um, we don't have margins on the left and right sides, things like that. Yeah. 
The, the original question, I mean, who do you turn to to do your design? Uh, I've always been a, a big proponent of having real designers on the team, uh, separate from the engineers. Uh, who should those people be? I don't know. If you know some, have them call me, because I lost mine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, but I think it's a huge that, that engineers shouldn't think of themselves as, as designers um, for interaction, necessarily. I mean, some can, some can't, but don't, don't kid yourself into thinking you're an artist just because you know how to pick up a paintbrush. It's not the same thing. Uh, I'd like to follow up on that. I mean, that's absolutely right. Design is hard. I mean, it's very easy to get a preference pane that has 700 checkboxes in it because you've got every feature that you've programmed in that you want to be able to make it configurable. Um, Less is, less is more. I mean, it's, it's often hard not to add a checkbox, make it maybe a default or something <laughs> that uh, is, is hidden. But um, you know, if you can get someone with good visual design skills to help you make your app better, that will do far more for your application than you know, sitting around and just you know, being the one person doing everything from start to finish. I'd also, though, say. Um you know, if you are a one or two person shop, you just might not be able to have uh, a designer on the payroll. Um, so in that case, you, you need to learn this stuff. Uh, you need to have a vision and a backbone, but then also get as much feedback as you can. Uh, a participatory uh, development process uh, can be a very good thing. Yeah, usability testing is absolutely vital when you're, when you're making new interfaces. And, uh, you know, I agree. I mean, as coders, we tend not to be particularly good at design. At least I'm not particularly good at design. And um, I'm lucky enough to have a usability guy on my beta team and a bunch of graphic designers on my beta team. And pretty much they design my interfaces. Uh, and, you know, I have veto power, of course, but they do a lot of the work of getting the interface together. I think one of the things that's kind of struck me about OS 10 as time has gone on has been I can, I can get if you can see a way that's better break the UI guidelines, but if everybody starts doing that, if everybody breaks the UI guidelines in the goal of making it better, then there is no consistency anymore. Yeah, but I, I think it's, uh, consistency is overrated, honestly. Uh, I mean, you know, there's a big movement and, and the people publish books and blah, 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 and I just think they're wrong. Uh, <laughs> It's like, it's like uh, how long does it take me to recognize a button? Yeah, it's a button. I, I recognize it. Oh, that's a brown button. Ooh, what is it? Oh, what? Oh, it's a button. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I can handle it, whether, whatever color it is. I don't care. Like, people go, you know, did you see the latest uh, the, the acquisition? What's it called? Acquisition. Ac acquisition. Aperture. Aperture. Yes, yes, different app. Aperture, and you know, and it's it's got this weird new thing that's not really pro, and it's not really not pro look, and it's the buttons are all different, and I'm like, great, I still recognize them. I know what a checkbox is. I don't I don't need for it to have the exact same pixels, and and frankly, I kind of like having the context. I kind of like being in an app and being like, oh, this feels like uh, aperture. It's got little camera theme to it, and maybe it's all black molded plastic because it's a camera. I don't know, but. The point is, I like I like having a different feel. I like uh, the the context. Uh, I don't I don't think it's important to be slavish about oh you know well the, the background changed a uh, slightly different change of silver so so that's it's wrong. Well, from an aesthetic point of view, I basically agree. From a you know what I do point of view, I totally disagree. But uh, <laughs> one of the problems though is that Apple has been tending, in my opinion, to design interfaces that look very cool and have a lot of flash, but the important part is that they sacrifice usability in the process. I think the Spotlight interface in Finder is a pretty good example no. of that. That interface has no, big no, no, problems. That wasn't design, that just happened. I agree. <laughs> but but, but there, there are quite a few of those that are like that. That all came together two weeks before. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's actually kind of interesting because you guys, a couple of you, both said it's really important to have graphic designers on your teams rather than usability guys on your teams. And do you think there's a major difference between designers and people who do usability? Do they go hand in hand? Are they? I think both are absolutely essential. Yeah, because you get designers without usability people, it can get pretty crazy quickly. <laughs> and unusable. There is a very large difference between being able to use Photoshop and being able to tell somebody how to write an app that's usable. And for the most part, you find UI designers are people who can do really, really cool stuff and have really cool vision, 
and HI designers are people that have gone to college and have spent time spent time learning how to do usability. And there's a, there's different skill sets. That doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of people that blend those together. But they're completely different skill sets. But they are definitely um, they mesh. And you you need both. And if you can find one who can do both, go for it. We're going to take a question up here. How about that? I think it worked. Um, along the same lines, I was going to ask you guys about um, about apps, um, the ecosystem of Macintosh software as it stands today. I was wondering if uh, if any of you want to respond to some of the following. Um, you know, what are present company excluded? Uh, what are some of your favorite uh, Mac applications? What do you feel are some of the the kind of gaping holes that we have? Um, in our in our little ecology, um, what do you think are, are cool opportunities, or do you feel like the energy is really going to go toward basically AJAX applications uh, and stuff like that? And we're not going to be having a meeting like this in five years because a platform specific application is not going to be a, an interesting thing to talk about. <laughs> I'm sorry, you maybe can't see it on the cameras, but like people just started raising their hands at the end of that one. Anyone? I, I don't think Ajax is going to kill desktop apps. Um, just the fact that there's network latency, just that alone, I think will kill it. Will will keep it from from killing desktop apps. Um, as far as my favorite app, I'm going to ignore the present company excluded part. Quicksilver is my favorite app all around. I want an Ajax version of Quicksilver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll provide a little contrast then to Jason. Uh, I think Axe, uh, Act Ajax will kill apps, but not the type of apps that uh, this panel is writing. Um, uh, for example, um, you know, the office automation type apps, uh, where you have a, a, a company that's working against a client server type architecture, and uh, you know they might have a Cocoa front end on that. I think right now the Cocoa apps that deal with like business automation and so forth, business processes, are in real danger of Ajax apps. I think Ajax is going to eat their lunch. I'll, I'll agree with that. There's definitely a large class of apps that Ajax is going to absolutely destroy. Aj Ajax is going to be huge, but I don't think it's going to kill all desktop applications. There's a lot of genres that it's just not suitable for, in my opinion. Gaping holes on the platform? I actually, one of my favorite applications on Mac OS X is probably Eudora. One of the gaping holes in any platform is email clients. They all suck. Every Agreed. single one of them lacks something significant that makes people want to switch to something else. But when they switch, they found out it's even worse than what they had originally. It's like that Escher staircase. You keep on going down. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. How many people are using Gmail even though they have a desktop email client? Well, not me, but. Looks like about 20 or so, 25. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of hands. I'll say that the big gaping hole in the market is backup. Uh, backup 3.0 is terrible. A retrospect is terrible. Everything sucks. Shared pocket software, super duper, looks good, doesn't do incremental history. Bacula. I agree. Yeah. What, what was it, Bacula? Bacula. Okay, never tried it, maybe that's good. Bacula. Good. I think when you're kind of having to step down to command line apps and that kind of stuff, he's made his point <laughs> pretty well. It's still good, just try it. <laughs> <laughs> The problem is Dance actually has some key patents on backups. We actually had a backup yeah, product once. I that. Wait, I'm sorry, can you back up here a little bit? What's that? What can was I, that again? I can't back up because they have patents on it. <laughs> Dan Dance has some, some key patents on backup technologies. Or they say they do. They actually, when they, when they wrote us a letter, they basically claimed that they have patented the idea of uh, writing files to a secondary storage device and keeping an index of what files you wrote on a main storage <laughs> device. And we said to our lawyers, you know, that's that's crap. This has been going on for 20 years. And the lawyer said, yeah, but you know, do you have $100,000 to fight it? And I said, no. And that was the end of Omni Group Backup, which was a program we wrote for Apple back when Mac OS X first shipped. As small developers, how many are afraid of software patents? <laughs> Since I lost a year of my life to it, yeah, that would be. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, how many of you are, are filing patents? Nobody has the money, and nobody has the expertise, I think, 
I've, like, I've looked into it, and it's prohibitively costly, yeah. and I don't have the resources to defend the patent should it be challenged. W what does costly mean? What are, you, what are they? Uh, it's been a long time since I looked, but my recollection is that it would have taken um, somewhere between 5 and 10K to file a patent. 10K seems to be the, the common metric. Now, Eric, you were saying that you, well, I don't know, can we mention that or no? Um, you have some software patents. We'll leave yes. it at that. Uh, so do you agree with software patenting, or is that just something that happened? Off the island. Okay. Um, off the record, personally, not a big fan. Okay. I work for a company that does, does believe in patent them, sure. software and, and believes in them, and in today's business market, I completely understand their rationale, and I will continue to help them sure. as an employee file and get new patents. But I think the obvious answer to the, the question is, I think a lot of us are, or should have a concern about it because I would a, company be like, a company like Apple can say, oh, look, we just made a patent on this because we paid a lawyer you know, for three hours worth of work, and they can do that like that. Yeah. And a small company doesn't have the resources to be able to do that when they come up with what is a really new idea. We, we once got email from Apple from their lawyers saying they, we had to take a feature out of an application that ships with Apple's because Apple was thinking about patenting that feature. I'm not kidding. That doesn't quite add up. I mean, it's, it's pretty that. amazing, isn't it? And I, and I was like, well, this is an app that only ships on Macs. It only helps your platform. Why would you uh, want to keep us from using this feature that you might think about patenting? And they're like, well, we want to have it for ourselves. And so I went and found an old version of Visio and discovered that that exact same feature was buried in one of the preference menus. And so I enabled it and made a movie and mailed it to their VPs, and that was the end of that. No. No, we gave up on that one. We're going to take another question here. Yeah, while we're talking about... Uh, While we're talking about uh, software and patents, uh, I can't help but think of just the uh, debacle with Confabulator and Apple and widgets. And since most of you here on the panel are independent software developers, at any point in your cycle in, in creating or even in just visualizing an application, do you ever fear um, Apple invading your turf or invading your territory? And, and if so, <laughs> <laughs> And if so, what is your recourse? Do you, do you try to, do you, do you need to feel like you're staying one step ahead of Apple, or or is the relationship kind of um, uh, falling apart as independent software developers? Well, me for a long time, I was afraid that Apple was going to ship an RSS reader, um, and then they didn't. So uh, I guess <laughs> I got very lucky there. Uh, uh, oddly enough, I'm not particularly worried about uh, Apple doing something that I do. And I say oddly enough, you know, because I write hacksies, which are things that go into the operating system and change the behavior. It's a very ripe market for Apple to take over. But, you know, I knew that going into the situation. At any moment, I expect that Apple could come out with something that duplicates my functionality. I know that. I accept that. If it happens, cool. I'll do something else. I was a bit upset about the Mighty Mouse thing, but <laughs> that's, a that's, that's a different story. That was just gratuitous. I'd say in answer to your question of what do you do if, uh, if you feel that something is starting to catch up with you, uh, from personal experience, I worked on, uh, and Royce and I as well, worked on uh, an application called MacAmp long ago, uh, probably about four or five years ago. And it was the first MP3 player for the Mac. Uh, and then SoundJam came out and Audio came out, and then iTunes came out. And uh, we fought iTunes for a little while. Panic fought iTunes for even longer. And we all got slaughtered. There's not much you can do to compete against a free application that ships on every single Mac that's out there. Uh, so as far as an actual, uh, an entire application, like an MP3 player, I think uh, there is a definite concern. Uh, I'm not sure for who here. I think we all have fairly innovative applications that Apple can't recreate without it being quite obvious, although perhaps the confabulator guys would have said the same thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't think they're worried about the obvious. But uh, so I think there's definitely a concern that Apple will compete uh, as they keep putting out new software. But at the same time, I think the way to stay ahead of it is not to compete directly, but to have a different innovative idea. Uh, so you know, Apple put out an MP3 player, so we moved on to other audio software. Uh, and that's the best way to try and fight 
what is effectively a juggernaut that you can't fight. Actually, Paul has brought up a good point here without really stating it explicitly. We're small and we can be nimble. And that's our strength in, you know, I, I won't call this a battle, but in the competition between us and Apple. We can change if we need to. As one of the uh, authors of OmniWeb, which is like the oldest web browser in existence, uh, oldest graphical web browser in existence, um, predates Netscape by like a year, predates IE by two years. Uh, Yes. <laughs> but my point is about OmniWeb, not me. <laughs> OmniWeb was actually started by Ken Case, so you know, congratulations. Um, but in that situation, obviously, when Apple came out with Safari, it was uh, it was kind of uh, devastating. Um, I think the right move should have been uh, to just open source the whole thing and bow out a year and a half ago. Uh, obviously, I'm not at Omni anymore, so. Clearly, you know, other people felt differently. Um, I don't. I don't have the numbers on on how well OmniWeb is doing, but I'm sure there are net statistics out there somewhere that that show how Safari is doing. Uh, at one point, OmniWeb did have like 60% of the Rhapsody market uh, market share, uh, so it was it was doing really well for a while. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, get the hell out. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, I, I'd like to say, you know, for the record, uh, Apple has treated me extremely well. Uh, over the years in this regard. Um, obviously, uh, two of my old apps bundle with Pro Machines. Um, there's another app that probably no one's ever heard of that they just bought outright from me. Uh, it was a PDF viewer back in the Rhapsody days. Um, and, you know, and, and there may or may not be things I can't talk about. But, but what I can say is, is they have treated, I felt, they've treated me extremely well. Um, and I've never had any of the issues where I felt like, you know, what? You just came out of the blue and, and killed my business? Uh, it's never happened. And, and, and on the whole, it's, it's been pretty amazing just how willing they've been to sort of uh, uh, actually license stuff or, or do deals with uh, me being a tiny little developer and them being a huge company. Uh, We're going to switch over to Gus here. Uh, I was going to say the other thing you can do, um, and Panic is the perfect example for this, is <coughs> diversify. Um, Panic had FTP and transmit first. Transmit, yeah, and they had audio software. And when SoundJam came, uh, <coughs> iTunes came out, they had something else to fall back on. So that's you know just like your portfolio. You know, this is my company. I'm going to make a couple different apps. It might not even come from Apple. You know, there could be a delicious iWiki someday, and uh, I'll get creamed by it. And then uh, um, you know, I'll have other apps to fall back on. So that's. But I think what you're hearing from just about everybody is OmniWeb got crushed. Uh, Mac Amp got crushed, Audion got crushed, and like I said, you can't compete with the free software that's everywhere. Sure. What's that? Sure. Yeah, uh, Sherlock, well, Watson. I mean, they made out perhaps all right. Uh, Sherlock uh, competing with Watson, uh, and the Confab guys actually got bought up by Yahoo, so hopefully they're doing all right with it. But uh, uh, you can't, if you read uh, the story that Panic put out after Audion got retired, it basically talks about how they spent so much time developing it and they were never able to keep up with Apple because you know, they had to support the iPod. Then they had to realize that iTunes had the music store and there was never going to be a way they were going to be able to do that. Uh, so like I said, being diversified, being able to fall back on their FTP client and then on their uh, Usenet reader uh, enabled them to stay around even if it didn't enable their products to stay around. Yeah, that's actually how Haxies were born. We heard rumors about Sound Jam 1 being bought and then iMusic coming out and we just we saw what was there immediately. We just pretty much gave up that day that we knew that the Unsanity Echo, Unsanity Mint, which many of you may have never heard of, were never going to sell against a free player that did more, like encoding, which we couldn't afford to add because of the patent issues. So we just gave up and went with Haxies, and I think that was a right decision. We didn't take a long time to make this decision, didn't waste everyone's time. We just made it immediately. So, and so, so Apple actually drove you to Haxies. It's, yeah. like, it's like, you know, <laughs> Batman and the Joker. You know, <laughs> he made you. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> We're going to switch off to another question here. Question, I have a question about um, Quicksilver and in, in terms of uh, interface guidelines. I'll does it, does it does it actually, I mean, this is a program that everybody loves, right? But it probably, it doesn't uh, uh, 
P use any of the interface guidelines, does it? I don't know. It's got those drop-down lists. Um, insofar as Interface Builder makes you put things near stuff, it has, but <laughs> for the most part, as the last guideline, I've always just used what seemed to be the best location for things. And it, you know, it's probably a bad thing to do, but sometimes I think just going the way it feels turns out with a better result than always conforming to the guidelines. Well, I think one of the things I've noticed with Quicksilver is it's an app to tr that tries to allow you to do certain things better, but at the same time, you're trying new things. I mean, you, you've, you've got some stuff in there that's, that's pretty different. Well, that Some of it doesn't always work right, but... The real intent of it is like a testing ground. It's not intended as a finished product, so I, it gives the opportunity to play with these things, and in the end, if, it, it, might be, it might stabilize, but just the flexibility of it allows things to be blurred, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and move on to a subject that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Digital rights management. DRM, who would like to, as well, we can, apologies. I can get a little worked up about DRM. <laughs> DRM is kind of, you know, it's, it's starting to take hold. People are starting to accept it with the iTunes Music Store, now with iTunes Video. I mean, it's really starting to take hold. What will it mean when we go buy a computer 10 years from now if it starts to take hold in other areas like controlling applications and where those can go, where documents can go? I think if they don't get it right, and they is a nebulous, uh, you know, Apple, Microsoft, whoever is really in control here, it's going to be pretty awful. Um, well, you were talking about Photoshop CS2, which has product activation. You have to connect to their, uh, their servers and, uh, and basically prove that you've purchased the software. And you were saying, were you not on the network when you tried to do this, or? Yeah, um, I, I'm on a mailing list with a bunch of Adobe friends, and uh, I believe it was Sunday morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, where I sent a message to them all saying, asking them all to die. Uh, because uh, the activation, um, I, I guess I made the mistake of like booting off another partition than what I installed on, and that, that is bad. And, and suddenly it that, didn't work. Yeah, the thousand dollars I paid for that software retail, that software was just a piece of, you know, it was a waste of space on my hard drive all of a sudden. Right, so right now, in terms of the iTunes Music Store, I don't think that, I think that the DRM there is at least decent. Uh, you generally can use the music as you want to. You authorize a computer and then it doesn't need to be on the network anymore. It already has a key so that it's authorized. Uh, but in terms of something like that, you purchased, like you said, $1,000 worth of software that suddenly he couldn't use. Uh, and I was, I, I was bringing up uh, CDs that have protection on them uh, that you can't rip MP3 files off of them. And this is DRM uh, designed to prevent piracy. But someone is always going to use some tool Audio Hijack Pro, <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to record the audio. And that's actually fair use. You're perfectly yeah. legally allowed to do that. And as soon as one person does it and puts it up on Nutella, up on LimeWire, up on uh, you know, whatever sharing network you have, the only people that are getting hurt by it are the people who have legally paid for the software, because, or for the uh, music, I'm sorry. Uh, so they purchase a CD and they can't access the music on it, but it's not preventing piracy. So well, due to a loophole, it isn't always fair use anymore. I mean, with the Digital with Millennium Copyright Act, if they have copy, that's one of the kind of scary things. The Digital Millennium DMCA basically says, yeah, you would have fair use if you could get to it because we didn't put copy protection on it. But by going around the copy protection, you're violating laws. That's true. And I think, well, in terms of the way I feel and the way that our companies run, we feel that those laws are wrong and incorrect and that you've purchased something and if you're using it legally, if you're not you know, making copies for 100 people, if you're using it, if you have an iPod and then some other music device that won't play iTunes music files, you should be able to do that. You've paid for this music. And I think just about any, everyone here could get behind that and say, I paid for it, I wanna be able to use it how I want. And consumers themselves you know, will say, I wanna be able to use what I purchased. The companies will say, we wanna prevent piracy and right now there's sort of this battle going on with DRM and how restrictive it's going to be. And I think it's, I, I can't tell you 10 years from now how it's going to wind up, but uh, I'm worried. I'm certainly concerned with uh, things like uh, Microsoft's Palladium 
uh, proposal, which basically was going to be a part of the computer that said uh, that everything had to talk to, and if it didn't talk to it, it wouldn't work. Uh, and this would control how you use the computer. Uh, so people are no longer, w with proposals like these, people aren't going to be purchasing things, they're going to be renting them uh, and still paying the same price. So I feel like right now we're headed on a path where people are losing the rights to use the things that they've purchased, music, software, everything. And you were shaking your head about product activation. I assume that was saying you would never do that, right? Well, I mean, I, I wish I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> or have to. We, I, I inherited a copy of CS2, and last night at 3 a.m. I was trying to install it on my new laptop. And uh, Adobe servers were down, and they were down until 12 today. And, and so you use it. I'm like, no, can't use the software that I want to do a presentation for. for but today. I'm, so I'm actually asking about in your own software. Would I ever do activation? No, I never do. Uh, and I don't think anyone here does currently. And I don't think anyone, uh, I hope no one would want to. Uh, but that's something that sort of we can uh, weigh in on this fight by not uh, making things so restrictive, uh, by keeping things open. Uh, all our software, you enter a code, and it checks with itself against a list of bad codes, uh, but it doesn't talk to the server. It doesn't say, this user at this machine is pirating our software, anything like that. Uh, you know, we have to protect ourselves, but you don't have to go as far as companies are trying to go right now. I don't think the DRM is inherently bad. I think that as long as it's weak DRM, it's okay. I mean, iTunes Music Store right now, you can strip the DRM. It's difficult to do. You have to find JM. You have to know about it. Uh, you have to navigate its arcane interface. You know, it's ugly. It's There's a large barrier to entry to doing it, but it is doable. I think that when DRM is weak in that way, you know, obviously you can also burn CDs and then, you know, bypass the DRM that way. I think it's okay like that. I don't love it, but I can live with it. It's when it becomes strong DRM that it's a problem with, you know, CS2, for example, where you just have no recourse whatsoever. Um, yeah, not a fan. And the problem is that, you know, the companies that are the ones that are pushing the DRM, they have no real motivation to make the DRM weak because they're doing it to protect their sales, so they want to make it as strong as possible. And there's no one really fighting to keep the DRM weak. I just have one small comment. You said you talk about fair use earlier. And fair use is defined in the law, however it's defined. If you don't like the way the law is defined, write your congressman. That's my only comment on fair use. I, I was wondering if we're, if we're not giving up too much even when we say that weak DRM is OK. Um, you know, because there's a line between weak and strong, and different people have a different opinion of where that is. And if we say, oh, well, weak, I can live with, um, that kind of opens the door a lot. Sure. I think one of the things that's fascinated me about iTunes is the fact they say you own this music, yet at any time there's a clause there that they can change what you can do with it, and they have done that. Right. And to date it's been to increase the number of computers you can use it on, but I, it was it decreasing the number of times you could burn a specific playlist? Mm -hmm. And it didn't really affect anything, but you're right, that, that showed what Apple can do, and that, like I said, you're renting this music much more than you're actually owning it. But there's a good side of the DRM that it actually enables this sort of distribution to actually work, because otherwise the music companies wouldn't even consider it, the iTunes music store wouldn't exist, and people wouldn't be able to have the convenience of just getting these songs when they want them. And to some extent, you just have to allow some of your liberties to be taken away that, so you can do this. And if hopefully we'll keep it in a way that it is weak so that we can take back what we own, but it's in order to enable it's worth it. Like, as Paul said, DRM is just a problem for legitimate users. Illegitimate users will just find a way around it. It only hurts people that want to follow the rules. iTunes Music Store really doesn't do that because the most it stops is people saying, oh, I got this new song. Here, transfer it over to AIM. And that's what it stops. It doesn't stop transferring to the most popular music player. It doesn't stop, tra doesn't stop playback on your, the OS you choose to use. It doesn't stop playback on CDs, you can burn them. But things like, I own about 900 or so anime DVDs. A few of them are from Japan. And I can't legitimately use those on my PowerBook because of region locking. I can't legitimately use it on the TV I have next to my bed because of DRM, because of region locking. And I could easily get around that by ripping it and then reburning it or doing something like that or region freeing the player, but I'd have to break the rules in, in order to use what I paid for. I think the one thing that is uh, perhaps gives me some hope is that 
uh, people are talking about it. Um, I don't know. I didn't get a chance to read it. I believe Walt Mossberg of the uh, Wall Street Journal, I mentioned this earlier, um, had an article uh, talking about boycotting CDs that have protection on them. Um, I, didn't, I didn't get a chance to read it, like I said. But uh, if that is what's, what he's saying, you know, that's a great thing that somebody is saying it. Um, and if enough people start talking about it and writing their congressmen and getting the laws changed uh, so that the DMCA isn't so restrictive, so that you can circumvent it for fair use, and that the only thing it's protecting is illegitimate use, or uh, preventing, excuse me, is illegitimate use, then uh, this doesn't necessarily have to end with us renting all of our data and not really having any control. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. And like I said, I'm not terribly hopeful about it, but there are uh, ways that this doesn't have to end so poorly. The, the DMCA, I think, is one of the biggest problems with DRM because uh, reverse engineering strong DRM is what makes it into weak DRM and the DMCA exists specifically to prevent that action. Mm -hmm. So that's really the big thing that's you know that's that's causing all the all the issues. I'm, I'm kind of concerned about you know we talk about yeah you have these restrictions but we can bypass them. Um, I'm kind of concerned that you know the very fact that we can bypass them and that they're fairly weak uh, legitimizes DRM. Uh, if if it was something that was that's a brick wall that oh no they've they've put this copy restriction on and I can't do it you know why do I buy it. That'd be a binary decision. I can't buy this because I can't use it. But because you can buy it, and then you can hit hit the dark nets and then break it, and then you have something else that you know the company's like, well, you're buying it anyway. That's a good point, actually. You're saying that it's a slippery slope. The existing DRM. That's a good point. And well, and there is a lack of options too. I mean, if you need Photoshop for the Mac, you have to eat DRM unless you go and can find an old version. Yep. Which you know. When Intel comes out, that's not really going to be <laughs> that fun. Okay, let me. Tr uh, as Paul was saying, that you could boycott CDs, but then the recording industry will just blame the drop in sales on piracy. Um, so? so? Which again legitimizes these. DRM? Which led. Yeah. 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 So. Fuck them all. Uh, we're going to take a question back here. <laughs> we're going to take a question right here. Right. Um, I'm at. So someone behind me asked about Quicksilver, and it just uh, something I've been meaning to ask uh, the Quicksilver dev. Uh, is there a chance? Uh, I mean, you've got what you call superfluous visual effects in the app, uh, which I absolutely <laughs> love. Would there be a chance of you, uh, for example, open sourcing your NS Windows subclass that does the really cool fade out effect, or your like your NS Box subclass that has the nice gradients and all that stuff? Or some, something along those lines. I know you don't want to open source the entire app, but the superfluous stuff would really be cool to have around. <laughs> uh, part of the problem is it's all based on all the private APIs that Apple uses. So I don't know that. I suppose it's good to release it to the public, but yeah, I would consider it. Um, I just worry about too many people doing that and making systems unstable. Would you consider it if we bought you three beers tonight? <laughs> Each. <laughs> <laughs> I probably wouldn't be in a position to consider anything at that point. <laughs> wow. We have another question up here in the back. Oops. Um, <laughs> hey, um, well, uh, I know uh, Quicksilver and uh, some of Ancenity's apps and uh, Shapeshifter all need basically users to make content. I mean, Quicksilver needs, the needs a lot of plugins that users go ahead and make other than the ones that ship with it. Uh, Shapeshifter needs themes. People go ahead and make hacksies. What do people think about basically needing the users who feel like to go and create stuff about making apps around that? Well, for Shapeshifter, that's why I do it, actually. I get a really big kick out of people creating stuff with the code that I've written. I get a gigantic kick out of that, and that's what drives me to do it. Um, as far as users doing it uh, kind of for free, gratis, uh, I'm not so into it. And we've discussed um, sponsoring theme creators to create themes. And we haven't reached any decisions, but I think we're all kind of in favor of doing it. Um, you know, it's good PR. It drives sales. There's really no downsides to it at all. Well, I think in fairness, when you look at some of the themes out there, it shows just how hard UI can be. 
I mean, that's, <laughs> that's that's very true. And not only that, I mean, um, you know, it's it's really hard to make a theme. It takes a good themer about a month and a half of solid work to put a theme together. And um, you know, any applications that use uh, their own custom widgets are going to look like metric ass. So <laughs> that causes a lot of problems as well. Well, I think that uh, it doesn't. It it doesn't quite answer the question, but uh, you mentioned Shapeshifter and Quicksilver as needing users. Uh, I, I think everyone here would agree with me that just about all of our applications need users. Uh, not so much to purchase the software, obviously that's the case, but in terms of helping us drive development, um, it's not all just coming from us. It's not coming from what we've said. Uh, whether users are uh, providing themes or providing ideas, uh, there's certainly a community around our software uh, that's helping it get developed. So it's not just software like uh, like Shapeshifter or like Quicksilver where actual code or actual uh, art is being submitted, but uh, the ideas that we get from users and the experience, the feedback that we get from them helps to drive the development of it. Uh, so I don't want the impression to be that those are the only applications that are dealing with their users uh, in any sort of way. I think that the point that he was making is that uh, Shapeshifter, for example, if there are no themes, right. it's, not, it's not a very compelling program. Uh, users can help drive a lot of decisions. Um, uh, when my company was bought by NewsGator, we have uh, had an app called Mars Edit, and um, we didn't know what we wanted to do with it, and I frankly didn't expect uh, that many people to actually care. Um, and then it turned out a whole lot of people did, and uh, that made us decide to continue developing it. Uh, and that was um, uh, totally user-driven. It was very much... I believe uh, you're announcing for the first time right now? I am right. indeed. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's pretty much new. <laughs> I worked that in. I had to figure out a way. <laughs> so are you going to be developing Newswire and Mars Edit? Or? Uh, we're getting help on developing Mars Edit. Uh, it's not all lined up yet, so I can't really say exactly who it is, um, though I wish I could. <laughs> you know, actually, that question kind of brings up another interesting point, which is open file formats. Um, as far as having you know, users uh, enjoying your application and using your application, uh, another way that's sort of been shown to drive use of an application is to create synergies with other applications, and using open file formats is an excellent way of doing that. So in the same way that you know, having users create content for your apps, uh, enabling them to create other apps that work in tandem is also very nice. Plug-in type stuff? Um, plug-in type stuff or maybe things that manipulate file formats or file data, you know, whatever. I mean, anything. Apple script. Uh, I was going to say Apple, Apple script. script. Yeah. Or yeah. That's an excellent example. Or yes. I really like the way Omni Outliner integrates with uh, Keynote for presentations. That was, uh, that was a cool hack, actually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, th th somebody asked earlier about uh, what the future of programming was. Future of what? Of programming the question up there, you know, what's the next thing after the current kits? And this right. this all ties in uh, with this, which is the open file formats. Um, I think the future is actually kind of here. Doo -doo. <laughs> um, and I think it's I think it's core data. Uh, I think uh, basically every application is a database application, and most people just don't have a history in databases, and so they don't really see it as they're designing it. But there's not an app I've ever written that wouldn't be better sitting on top of SQL Lite. Um, OmniGraffle, for example, which, by the way, I don't want to give the impression that I actually wrote that. That was written by Kevin Steele. I was project lead for version 3. Just want to clear that up. Um, but, but that app, for example, some people would, would create 20,000 graphics and then load in this file, which was a, you know XML file, and they'd be like, huh, it's slow. And I'm like, huh, what? <laughs> oh, who knew, you know? Uh, but if you know if if you if you switch something like that to X, uh, to, to SQL where you actually you know do some intelligent fetches and it's really easy with core data to say oh, only give me the part that's actually on the screen right now uh, or only give me the data that's relevant to it uh, you can handle that you can handle hundreds of thousands of objects uh, as we're seeing with that aqua ac aperture aperture <laughs> application we're gonna take another question up here. So obviously, at the end of the day, our ability to do all this cool stuff is ultimately really contingent upon just the really practical side of getting the word out, getting people to know about the software, getting to use it, getting to build cool things to go with it, and, and ultimately to buy it. So um, can you guys I mean, share some other strategies that you've had in terms of uh, good ways of generating some kind of buzz or knowledge or? Definitely have a web blog. Um, Part of what you're selling, I think, is is you and and your company, and um, 
you know, and your willingness to be open and talk to people. If people can get engaged with you and with you and by extension with your software, um, that's really helpful. Well, I think what you said earlier uh, with the market is a conversation. It's it's from a book called Clue Train, uh, from I think it was about ninety nine, uh, yeah. which uh, should you know you think maybe you should be ignored because the dot com burst was right after that. But I think it's certainly true, uh, and you're bringing it up in terms of having your own weblog, just having a dialogue with your customers, uh, with the core group of people who uh, initially find your product, uh, the more you interact with them, the more that they feel sort of accepted, uh, sort of part of what you're doing, uh, the better word of mouth is going to spread. I think just about everybody here can say that their best form of advertising is probably word of mouth. Uh, none of us has a very large advertising budget. Uh, Brent, you spent $20 on advertising lifetime. $20, yes, uh, on perversion was, tracker. It was a perversion tracker ad. That's something he's proud of, and that's great. Um, <laughs> we've spent, uh, in terms of advertising, we spend a few hundred dollars a month on various websites uh, to drive traffic to us. But it's nothing like, uh, like Apple, where they've got ads on TV and everything like that. You're not going to get the word out that way. Uh, so the big thing for us is word of mouth, where you have an application that does something, and a lot of people need it, they need to find it somehow. And Google is a great way to find stuff, but when someone says, oh, hey, you need to do X, this application does it, and it's a friend of theirs, they're instantly going to say, oh, I'll, I'll check that out and ask questions about it and be able to, uh, to get engaged with it, uh, specifically because someone that they know already is. Uh, so I think the biggest thing for, for us, and I think probably for everyone out here, is, is engaging with your customers in such a way that it generates uh, a buzz uh, and generates word of mouth. Um, what was the name of that book again that you mentioned? Clue Train Manifesto. Yeah. Um, I, this is interesting. It, it sort of brings up the idea in, in broader terms of community um, around your products and around your companies. Um, obviously, a weblog. But there's also other tools, wikis or um, mailing lists, and getting your customers engaged. I, I'm sort of curious what your experiences have been with interacting with your customers, getting feedback, and, you know, I mean, um, and, and, you know, uh, some good war stories. <laughs> I, I was actually going to make the same point and use the same word, community. I think that building a community around your around your products is an excellent way to keep things going and to build buzz. Um, you know, because first off, communities tend to suck in more users, and second off, you don't necessarily need to always be there keeping the community going. Once they get to a certain size, they tend to be self-sustaining, which is nice. Um, wikis are a great way of doing it. Forums are a great way of doing it. There's mailing lists. You know, there's a ton of different ways, and they satisfy a lot of different needs that people have. You know, they give community. Obviously, they give fulfillment. Um, there's, you know, they they make people happy essentially, and that's, you know, I mean, that's the the point. That's the idea. You want people to be happy, and you want them to associate that with your software, and then buy more. <laughs> User groups, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, uh, you and uh, Wolf run one of the user groups around here. So, I mean, certainly, uh, I like to give presentations to user groups because it's a great way to interact with people and get uh, ideas, get feedback on what, exactly what we're doing from real-world users uh, outside of you know handling support email, things like that. Um, but what I was going to say is that you were talking about how this helps drive sales, and that's certainly the case, and that's what that's what I was saying. Um, but I think you need to realize that it's. It's not just that simple. You need to actually be engaged with your customers. It can't be just a tool to create more sales. Because if you're artificial and if it's, if it's just being used as a way to sell uh, your product, people are going to see through it and people are going to realize that it's not, uh, it's not genuine and it's going to backfire on you. So uh, something that we try to keep in mind at Rogue Amoeba is respecting our customers. So we have a mailing list uh, with just about everybody that's purchased our software on there. And we contact them about four times a year, four to six times a year, uh, in the hopes that they'll be interested in what we've just come out with or you know, with uh, coupons on products of our own or on other people's products that relate to our work. And it's, sort of, it's designed as a, as a way to sort of say thank you and to keep people engaged with us, but just to keep them interested uh, and to sort of just give them a sense of community. But without, it's not designed solely as a way to create sales. Uh, it really is something where we're respecting them and we're saying, you know, we're really appreciative of everything that you've done for us. You've put the food on our table. You've made it possible for us to create this software. And uh, instead of just using it as a tool, uh, and I'm not saying that's what you were, what yeah, you were I, I, I'm definitely not saying that that's what I do. Right. It's, uh, it's not, but it's not a tool just to create sales. It's simply sort of one way that we've seen works. Uh, we've, uh, 
personally, we've been genuine about dealing with our customers and sort of creating a sense of community, and it's helped us. And I think uh, just about everybody here can uh, say the same thing. Uh, you can also create sort of a false community, and it's going to fall apart, I think. Yeah, it's, I mean, out. it's very fun to put communities together. You know, it's a good time, and as I said, it makes everyone happy. It's great for, you know, there are really no drawbacks. We're going to switch off to another question up here. Uh, yeah, more on the marketing and publicity. Uh, I, I'm, I'm part journalist here. I write for Mac Addict, and I have a site Mac Teens. I've always noticed that dealing with small developers are always more than willing to give me serial code and stuff to work with the products. Actually, I'm writing an article on Ma uh, Shapeshifter for Mac Addict, which I, I probably just broke some contract now, so <laughs> you just keep that quiet, please. So you're, do you think that's a good... You're, you're welcome to have a serial number. Okay. I, I actually got... <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I was going to ask, but actually, I'm so far so good without needing it, but... Um, do you think that's a good way of marketing, sending out product codes? Are you hesitant to do that? Not at all. If someone wants to write about my stuff, they're more than welcome to get a serial number. I mean, you know, if, well, all of our stuff has demos, so you could do it without, as you said. But, you know, if you want to write something about one of my products and give me publicity, I'm going to help you in any way that I possibly can. Do you know how many blogs are going to email you <laughs> once this goes online? <laughs> Um, you need a press card. <laughs> no, I, 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 I totally back that up. I, I, we've mailed out so many free copies to just everybody, just, you know, one guy who has a friend in Alaska, and we're like, yeah, mm -hmm, free copy for you. <laughs> um, we actually, we draw a line at the scanners because those cost real money, and people are like, can I get a comp scanner? And I'm like, yeah, you'll have to write for a real magazine to get a comp scanner. But, um, but, uh, but my saying has always been, uh, you know, if I gave this software away to half, the Mac users in the world, and they recommended it to the other half. I, I'd be the most successful software vendor in the entire world, you know. So it, it's it's something you don't get stingy with like onesie twosie copies, because if you're giving it to someone who even has two friends, you made more money than you lost. You lost nothing by typing in this thing, and and you just made two two sales. So it's we've mentioned community, or actually you guys have mentioned community quite a few times. Has the Mac community changed noticeably over say the last five years, the last ten years? your actual customers and, and how you interact with them and, and how you see them interacting with your software? Uh, it's certainly gotten larger and I think more energetic and um, the weblog world has really just changed things hugely. Um, there's constant feedback all the time uh, and, and it's a great thing. The level of engagement is just super high compared to what it was five years ago. How, how big is the web, weblog universe uh, for Mac versus the Windows world? They have web blogs? <laughs> yeah, I would say it's a disproportionate. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that they, they have a really high count, but um, there seems to be uh, more of a voice on the Mac side that, uh, you know, in terms of the size of our market, which is actually quite small, well, you know, we get a lot of linkage from the Windows side. The only real difference that I've noticed is that they don't seem uh, beleaguered and desperate <laughs> anymore. Um, back in, you know, 2000, 2001, if I got support email, you know, no one ever said, um, I'm working on a minority platform, but there was always kind of that feel, and now it seems like people sort of have a, you know, chest-beating RARP going on. <laughs> well, I think it's, we've seen the OS X community in general get revitalized, or the Mac community get revitalized by OS X, and I think it's helped everybody here in terms of customers are willing to purchase software again because they're not worried that Apple's going out of business, uh, and then it's driven us to create more software, which then drives more sales, which then drives more creation. Uh, so I think the community, l like uh, Brent was saying, it's grown, and it's also grown much more uh, involved and much more engaged with what, what everyone is doing. I would also say that there's definitely a higher technical quotient of, of the community uh, than there was on the Mac OS 9 days. I mean, there was a lot of uh, the, the putting Unix underneath Mac OS 10 brought a lot of the gearheads out into uh, our world. I, I think what's what's going to be more interesting, actually, is the next five years, actually. I mean, the last five years has been incredible, right? It's been the transition from OS 9 to OS 10. But the next five years with the Intel switch, uh, I think we're going to triple, quadruple our market share easily. And what that's going to mean for small developers is just, I mean, phenomenal. You know, just everybody here, you know, quadruple your salary. <laughs> <laughs> Who's not happy, right? Like, <laughs> Actually, as far as I feel user, left out. <laughs> <laughs> as far as the user base diversifying, I've definitely noticed that between Shapeshifter and Chicken of the VNC with support emails. 
the shapeshifter people are, you know, generally they seem to be kind of the same people that might have used Mac OS 9, although updated 10 years. But the chicken of the VNC people, I don't know if those people had an analog in the Mac OS 9 days. Um, they're, they tend to be very technical and they tend to really know what they're talking about. And uh, not to say that the shapeshifter people don't, but I mean, they tend to know what they're talking about in technical aspects. Um, and I don't think those people were around in Mac OS 9, or at least they weren't very prevalent or very vocal. We'll switch off to another question here. Actually, to follow up on that, while you guys are talking about support and stuff like that, I wonder how you guys deal with the support burden that you guys see, even in, and then, you know, with the possible increase in usage, you know, with switched Intel and all that, that makes good news, but then that should give you, you know, four or more times of support to deal with. So I'm just curious as a, everybody's experiences. Well, some of us sell out to larger companies and <laughs> get back to development and love their lives again. Yeah, yeah. I, I bought NewsGator um, or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, but now I now I have a support staff and um, you know they're really great and um, you know I, I launched Xcode the other day for the first time in like two months and it it was just fun. I got to do programming. I loved it. I mean, so you gotta you know once your program gets big enough you got to hire people or sell out or do something. You need help. Or die. Or die. Um, yeah. Fire, which was my old product. I stopped working on that thing years ago. But um, one of the problems with Fire was I had a full-time job. I work a lot of hours before working on Fire. You know, 70, 80, 90. I have a two and a half year old kid. I've got a wife. I wanted to have some sort of life. And the reason that Fire isn't the prevalent instant messenger outside of iChat anymore is because of the fact that I couldn't hire people. I couldn't, there was no way, we had a community and we had all this other kind of stuff, but at a certain point you just say, okay, well, I, I had to give it up. I couldn't work on that anymore because of the fact that, and, and I think maybe you might have been heading in some of the same kind of, it's like, wow, I, I'm stretched too thin. You know, you had a full-time job doing this, and this was, you know, Fire was at some point, especially when AOL was like changing the protocol every third hour. Um, I was like, you know, I, there were days where I was like, oh, no sleep today, woo! And because I had, you know, a couple thousand people saying, when am I getting my Fire back, man? When am I getting it back? And it was a great community, but the burden of the community is what caused me to stop working. Now, this isn't everybody. Of course, this is, you know, my personal cross to bear and everything. But uh, so you have to, as the independent developer, I was, you know, being on the side all $205 I ever made off of fire. Um, that's what you get when you ask for donations, donations? which people yeah. feel yeah, like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I turned around and spent on taking all the new developers out for lunch one day. Um, that's, that's a profit margin for you. <laughs> um, the, the burden can get so high that you have to, it, if you want to do it right, you do it right. Or, or really, don't do it at all. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of an anti-story uh, to what the rest of these guys are seeing. Of course, I have the job, and I'm, you know, I'm, uh, these guys are all doing this as their job, and this was my side project, which could have easily become a job. Uh, on a related point, if it's a job, it's a job. But if you're doing it as a hobby, know that you're doing it as a hobby. Well, that's why Fire was never going to, you know, when I was writing Fire, Fire went from version 0.13 to 0.14, to O.15, and I had all intentions of it being O.100, O.101, O.102. It was never going to, you know, 1.0 while I worked on it because it was my hobby. I wrote Fire for me. I was the only person that I wrote it for, and the fact that a community developed around it, that was all great. That was absolutely phenomenal, and yeah, I totally got my kicks. Totally got my kicks off of seeing the community grow up and all that kind of stuff, but I was writing it as a hobby. I was writing it, you know, I wrote, you know, there's, I don't know, a dozen programs up off of Epicware that I wrote just because I w there was a little thing that I wanted to write, and I wrote it, and I put it up there, and people either liked it, they didn't like it, and I didn't care. I did it for myself, and the fact that people came along for the ride was absolutely phenomenal. And I'm sure that some of the other products up here have, you know, had roots in that, that kind of stuff. They were started by guys, it'd be great if I could theme my entire OS. And what if everyone jumps on board? Woo! You know, but... There are certain products, you know, once you say, this isn't a hobby anymore, this is a job, make it a job. Well, at what point, I think the, what I haven't heard is, is a kind of an example of when you knew you were in trouble. At what point, oh, what, I, when, what no, size I, does it have to get to? I knew, I knew uh, when I was in trouble when, the, I don't know, the second time that AOL broke, okay, so AOL did this really, really cool thing 
where they released uh, their instant messenger already had this Trojan built into it, where they would actually jump to a position in memory and read a code and then send that back to the server. The server would respond with a new code. It would jump to a new position based on that code that was sent back from AOL, grab a bit of the, out of the binary, and then it would authenticate. Okay. So, of course, this means that, well, unless you've got AOL's binary on your system, there's no way you're going to be able to authenticate. Well, this took the game guys, I don't know, probably three or four days to really figure out exactly what was going on. So Fire was down. There was no AOL because I basically piggybacked off what the game guys were doing and all the guys over on Linux. And this was before the days of, you know, ADM existed, but it was broken too, and it was using the old tickle-based uh, interface. Talk. Talk, yes. Um, and Proteus was still new, and this was, really, was pre-iChat. And I sat there, and I don't know, I probably received eight, 9,000 emails over those four days. Some of them were duplicates of people, where's that? Where's it at? Where's it at? And <laughs> at that point, I realized, I can't do this. You know, and you know, it's not like my boss was giving me time off so I could handle this deal. You know? We were trying to bring up Rhapsody. You know? so, and, and working a lot of hours to do so. And that's when I really realized that, you know, this was fun. Oh, and the second example, when I got the subpoena from AOL's lawyers, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't fun. Um, and, and, and at that point, it's like, well, I can't fight it. You know, Will, Will went through the same thing. Other guys have probably done the same thing. There's no, I can't afford $100,000 to fight him, so I just call up the lawyer. What do you guys want? What do you want me to do? And all they really wanted, and this was the stupid part is, you know, you get this big packet in the mail, you got to go to the post office and sign for it and all this kind of good stuff, and you walk, get back and you open it up in the parking lot because you're like, who sent me this? And wow, AOL's lawyers, that's not fun. And I call them up and they wanted me to change that little running man icon. <laughs> <laughs> the, the running man's a trademark. And I'm like, call me, <laughs> drop me an email. I am me. You have 15 of my accounts. <laughs> but I mean, those two things, when AOL bro started breaking the binaries and I couldn't keep up, and then when the lawyer started calling and it's like, and you know, my bosses and my boss's bosses and my boss's boss's bosses weren't real happy that I was working on fire. It was my own project before I started at Apple. It was the first open step one. It was started when I was on open step a little bit. But you know, when they started thinking about iChat, I wasn't really in really cool water there either. You know, they started turning up the heat a little bit when iChat started getting a, a seed at Apple. It was too much. It was too much. So, so the, the point that you're making is that external pressures were forcing you to update your software more than you were willing or well, uh, able, able to do. Just able. I mean, there, it was me. I mean, there were two or three other guys that were helping out, which was great. You know, having, it's more of the community thing, you know, especially if you've got an open source app. No, I don't think anyone up here has a, an open source app. You've got devs. Yeah, you've got one. Yeah. Um, there, it's nice to have people helping out. But I was still, a, this is my baby. You know, this is, it's a, it's a toy, but it's still my program. And it's great, and it's fun. And other people were contributing, but it was still mine. And it was really hard to say, okay, well, I have to give this away now. But I did it because I had to give it away now. You know, the kid's 18, send him to college. It, it had to be done because there was just, how, you know, how many, 120 hour weeks can you do when you know 60 of that is for fun and you're not getting any pay and your wife is going movies I want to go to the movies and just one more second I think I just broke their encryption again yes. Well, I think I think that that's at least an answer to your question about when is it too much when the when the external pressure gets to the point where you're not adding new features, you're no longer scratching your itch, and it's just not fun anymore. Yeah, fire became very not fun for the last, and I kept going for six, eight months after it became not fun. And then I realized that, oh, I was putting out releases that sucked. The app wasn't really getting any better. I was just fixing you know, bugs for one or, one or two specific people. And when it becomes not fun, it's time to throw in the top. I've, I've been in a bit of danger with that with Shapeshifter because I've spent about six months just updating for Tiger to regain functionality that I had on Panther. And, you know, that sucks. That's not fun at all. And that's external pressure pushing you to write code that you don't want to do with users, you know, that expect that to happen. And um, I think maybe one way to get out of that is to drop it. Another way is to change stuff so that you're no longer dependent on the external pressures. So Back to the original support question, uh, 
At this point, Delicious Monster is actually just me and two support people. Uh, and my feeling on support Can you give me their names and uh, <laughs> email addresses? Well, you already, you already know one of their names because I, I put it on my blog. Uh, I was one of the, the kids who responded to one of my questions on the blog. I just hired him uh, remotely to answer questions. Uh, they're both in college. They're both full-time college students. And I, I truly believe that support was invented for uh, college students or college students were invented for support or <laughs> something like that. Uh, they both love the product. They both love computers. Uh, you know, I wouldn't hire just random people off the street. They're, they're both people who are very much active in the Mac community, but they're also people who, uh, you know, they're not looking to make this their career. So they're very smart. Uh, when they get out of college, they'll go do something else, and I'll hire some more starving college students. Um, you pay them peanuts. Uh, they love the prestige. It's really good for them. They move on to better jobs. Uh, so I consider it sort of a solved problem. I mean, I don't spend any time on support anymore. Uh, although I did get like a three-minute voicemail message today from one of my sport guys about something. But, but other than that, it's, it's great. They, they prioritize the bugs. They do it all. So, um, As an aside, all the, ex all the developers that were the external developers that were helping out were on, on, in all cases except one were college students. Because you're right, it's the same thing. They love this. They love the prestige. I worked on this thing. It's great. It's fun. It's cool. I can put in two hours. I can do no work today. I can do whatever. And the other guy just happened to be a retired engineer in Utah or something. I, I think the answer to, to the question of when do you know it's too much is, like Brent was saying, is when you don't have time to develop anymore. When you're no longer advancing the product and you're solely dealing with fixing the product uh, and handling the problems that people have, it's time to either uh, bring in support people by bringing yourself into another company, as Brent did, uh, hire support people, as Will is saying he did, um, and you know just get it so that you're doing what you need to be doing to advance the product instead of just treading water. Bring all this talk about support um, reminds me of a, a related topic. When I hear support, I think, oh, darn, there's a bug I'm going to have to fix. Um, so I wonder what everybody up here uses for um, bug tracking. I mean, Notepad's gr uh, a text edit's great, but um, shows that Bob works on Windows quite often, right there. <laughs> 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 Not when I can avoid it. Uh, with Unsanity, we use Jira, and I am absolutely in love with Jira. I adore Jira. I, I second that. I also use Jira. It's a, it's a pretty incredible application. Uh, I use, um, for, for Geekspiff and for Chicken, I use uh, something open source that I can't remember the name of. And it's nice, but it's not, it's not Jira. How do you spell Jira? Uh, J-I-R-A. What, what is it that you like about Jira? It, it's just smooth. It, it's just the yeah. workflow coming in, prioritizing, uh, prioritizing stuff. It's just, I, mean, it, it's, I think it's about 20 Java developers out of uh, Australia. Yeah. And, um, it, it just, and, and actually, uh, most of them are Mac users, too. What, uh, what, I, what I like about Jira is that I've never had to go into the database and edit something manually because the interface won't let me do it. Yeah. We're going to take another question over here. Obviously, with the change of platforms moving to the Intel architecture and things like that, are any of you guys running into any problems in porting code, or have you even started with that? Uh, are we allowed to talk about that? Technically, no. <laughs> Are you going to no. tell us? Are you going to tell on us? No, I'm not. There's cameras this is, right there. Yeah. <laughs> this is being taped. Um, I mean, you can talk about code. I mean, and the, uh, obviously the develop the DTKs are public, and I mean Apple's publishing stories for about people who are doing the transition. So you can't talk about the details about you know how the the DTKs work, but I mean you can talk about your experiences um, uh, that you run into in your personal products. Uh, personally, uh, it, it's it's been troublesome for me, uh, mostly because. Uh, some of my projects are very involved and interdependent, and and um, the, and uh, the f fact that the architecture is not PPC and it's now I three three eighty six, that's enough to break uh, pretty much all my projects. So I have to go in and manually fix them. So it's it's more of a busy work type thing than anything. I'm sure once I get to, and that said, you know I have I have modern apps too that I, is just a recompile. So it so most it doesn't seem to be so much of um, a, a big effort, ex except for uh, the things that are big efforts are more menial efforts. It's not like big intellectual challenges. Chicken of the VNC was trivial. 30 seconds, compile, run, flawless, uh, which was really nice. Shapeshifter, absolute hell. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, were, we started 
working on it at uh, WWDC, um, and had a had a working version relatively quickly. It's not that there's anything that's incredibly difficult, like you said. It's that there's a lot of little crap to deal with, and I think I would imagine that everybody here has started on uh, on versions for uh, the Intel Max, but. Uh, it's it's definitely something that nobody should be uh, should be waiting on if they have a commercial product, because you don't want Apple to come out with an Intel Mac uh, January 9th, and uh, suddenly you don't have a product out there. So uh, we've uh, we've been working on that, and we're continuing to work on it at a at a rather steady pace. But again, it's not something that's there's any huge headaches or huge flaws that uh, that need to be dealt with before we before work can continue. It's just a process that has to be done, and uh, if you want to stay on the Mac platform, you're going to do it. Uh, you're not going to be able to sit on PVC for five more years. Yeah, I, I agree with that, that it's the small things that are making it difficult. Um, with Shapeshifter Theme Park, getting the basic functionality running was about an hour, right. but then clearing up the little tiny things, absolute hell. But there are plenty of cases of apps that, you know, you sit down, you do it, and, and they're done. I, I had that experience at WWDC. Uh, there was a, uh, a lab there with uh, Apple uh, employees, and they helped me get my stuff done, and I haven't had to deal with it since. Uh, I even got an Intel Mac just because I kind of wanted one. Yeah, I should but mention I that in, in my case with Shapeshifter, obviously that's not a standard scenario. Shapeshifter is a hacksy, and it's tied pretty closely to the operating system and does, you know, hackish stuff. With the standard Cocoa apps, it's generally pretty trivial. I wouldn't be, yeah, as a user, I'm not too worried about what's going to happen in, whatever, six months, uh, whenever Apple finally does come out with the uh, Intel-based Macs. I think it's something that everyone's dealing with uh, pretty well, and that hopefully the system will deal with for the applications that are slower. Uh, we'll see how that goes, but I think as far as app applications that are still in development, uh, you're going to see new versions of them pretty quickly. Uh, hopefully from everybody here and hopefully from, you know, the most important applications that you use, uh, you'll see new app new versions of it uh, as soon as those machines are available. Yeah, what, what stinks is I think Adobe has announced that they're actually going to be charging for their Intel version, yep. which I think is kind of suck. And uh, I'm announcing Why? I'm not going to be charging for mine. Why is it suck that they're yeah. charging for it? Yeah. I'm just curious as, as to, oh. I'm not... You're not your name, right? I'm just curious as to as to why it does suck. I, the I, for I the I'm, I'm just sick of spending the money again and again <laughs> on the same damn program. Right, you're not gaining anything from uh, the transition. As as a user, this should be pretty transparent, and they shouldn't be charging you. I re they do have to do more work on it, but you're not gaining anything from the work they've done. Uh, so it's a tough it's a tough call it's a tough sell for users to say, well now it's going to run on your new Mac, uh, but it doesn't do anything new. But give us another, I don't know, is it an upgrade fee or is it a? Fee. Yeah, but still give us another two, three hundred dollars uh, just because we had to spend some time on it. Um, so I think it's, uh, I think. Well, he said he's going to Okay. Yeah, so I'm, that's, I'm sure that's that there will be something plus, new in there, like, uh, you know, a, a second color picker next to the first color picker. <laughs> <laughs> something really important. In a new space monkey? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, since we can't really talk a whole lot about certain aspects of 10.4, 10.5, what about 10.4 do you really, as developers and possibly users, do you really want to see improved in 10.5? Can I say Finder? <laughs> <laughs> no. I would have to say the tech system. I mean, I love the tech system in 10.4. I just, it's absolutely wonderful. But it could be a lot better, a lot faster. One of the main slow points of, other than being Cocoa, of Mac OS X is the tech system. It needs to be significantly sped up. Core image is one of the coolest things that I've ever seen. The um, API, I always describe it as being um, theoretical computer science concepts that have been made appealing to developers and appealing in the real world. It's just awesome. But actually working with it is pretty nasty. Um, and uh, it has, the, the, the problem I think is that video cards are all a little bit different and they act on image data in slightly non-deterministic ways. And it can cause some kind of strange stuff. I think that's, I speculate that that's why Apple hasn't activated their Quartz Extreme Extreme, Double X Extreme or whatever the <laughs> hell it is. Uh, I'd like to see that get fixed. Somebody in the audience mentioned Font Picker, which I think is an excellent point. The, a lot of the panels got rewritten apparently in Carbon and they're just a mess. And like Font Picker right now, you can highlight a font and then there's weird little buttons for like yep. 
underline and color and strike through. And first off, how often do you even do strike through? But second off, they don't actually even reflect the state of whatever you're highlighting. And especially the color one where it's this weird modality thing where you press the color and then the next time you set the color, it changes the text, but not the next, next time. And you don't really know that. There's no way to actually tell. And it doesn't actually draw the color. And also, it's not really something that makes you think of color because it's not like a colored character. It's just a swatch of color. And you're like, is that the background or the foreground? How do I know? There's no way to know. It, uh, is, it is an absolute mess. The font picker is the worst. That, Does by the way, is a good example of uh, making interfaces look pretty while sacrificing functionality. Yeah, well, I mean, you find that in almost all the ones that got sort of carbonized. They, they, they really lost a lot of, like, just Font picker was not carbonized. What? That you're saying that's not carbon? Because those buttons do not pop up. That's normally. cocoa. In that's fact, if you try to use it in carbon, you'll see an error about interface builder class not being found. Well, the, the, the buttons are not behaving. The pop-up buttons don't behave like normal NS pop-ups. So whatever they did, they wrote their own custom stuff for that. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's cocoa with custom graphics. I think there's a lot of room for Spotlight's metadata handling and just the ability to add your own. Um, oh yeah. Sort of er all the stuff is there, but not sort of implemented yet and it seems like once you're able to tag files and just tack on whatever you want it will be much more useful I think what you're hearing from a lot of us actually is that there's all this great technology and it's not quite done <laughs> it's all I don't want to say half baked it's uh, it's half cooked really uh, and with 10.5 and with every update that comes out we're hoping that you know various pieces get a little bit better and get a little bit more usable uh, so that we can add functionality, like uh, dealing with metadata and things like that. Uh, there are APIs for it, and sometimes they suck, like core image. Uh, there are, you know, you can try and use it, but it doesn't always necessarily work the way you want it to. So it's sort of a, an incremental improvement that uh, we're looking for more than some grand new idea. Well, the one thing that I'll, I'll mention that I'd, I would love to see in 10.5 is uh, I agree with Will that core data is amazing, and I would like to see client server core data, which basically is rebirth Absolutely. of EOF. Um, the other thing uh, I would like to see is, actually I fell on my head, so never mind. <laughs> oh, I'm, I, uh, core data, again, relate to Apple scriptability. I mean, I think there's enough information, that information there, that pretty much you have a core data app and you get Apple scriptability for free. I have a lot of hope for the Finder. Um, up until 10.4, uh, the Finder was implemented using really old school uh, Mac OS 8 appearance manager era APIs. And I think that that, I, I don't know this, but I speculate that that probably limited the Finder team quite a bit. And with 10.4, they finally moved to modern HI view based architecture. And I think that's going to open up a lot of possibilities for future development. They're no longer constrained by choices that they made in 1994. Assuming the ma managers allow them to do that. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're gonna move on from that one real quick. Um, Okay, we're going to have to wrap this up, actually. We kind of, uh, we have a space rented out. Um, Is that the sole reason tech. you have that there? <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, yeah. And, and do you just have the, the two slides, one with the cow, one with Jack Staff? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's the slowest slideshow ever. <laughs> Did you use Keynote for that? <laughs> uh, oh, PowerPoint. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> How fast they turn. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one last uh, pitch for the local programmer user group. Um, in addition to inviting people to come, if anybody's working, on a project and would like to present. We have a fairly good open door policy. Please contact me and um, uh, we'd like to see you present at the user group first Tuesday of every month at the Apple Store. Thank you. It's a programmer's user group, Coco, Web Objects, anything Mac development related. Thanks. We did kind of joke that the talk was an excuse for the after party. Um, it's going to be at 901 West Jackson. You guys are all invited if you'd like to come. Um, excuse me? Uh, yeah, well that should be fine outside. We'll take care of that. I do need to thank everybody for coming and especially participants. And you guys can join me and give them a round of applause for it. Like I said, many of them came here on their own time. Oh, <laughs> I, I would personally like to thank Adler for hosting us here. I mean, this is great. It's a great event. Uh, you know.
there are a lot of people who could have been pulled out from this show and it still would have been fine, but this guy wasn't one of them. Hey, and uh, Thanks, DB? Thanks, we appreciate Al. it. Yeah. And, and Drunken Batman, thanks for putting this together, man. Yeah. Hey. All right, we'll see you guys at the bar. Have a good night if you're not able to come. <laughs>